Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order on Tuesday, September the 6th at 7.02 p.m. And certainly want to thank all of you that are here this evening. Uh, if we could just take a moment for solid meditation, please. Thank you. I ask Councilman Davis to lead us in the pledge. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Councilmember Davis. Councilmember Johnson. Councilmember Moffitt. Here. Councilmember Reese. Here. And Councilmember Shule. We have several uh, proclamations this evening, uh, five in, in fact, and I would ask uh, Councilman Julian Johnson if she would proceed to the podium to present the first proclamation. Good evening, everyone. Um, we are so fortunate tonight to have Betty Lehem Kloss, um, a Durham resident who uh, recently made it to the finals of the 2016 Scripps National Spelling Bee. She's a, a student here um, in Durham Public Schools, and we are um, have prepared this proclamation to celebrate her achievement. Um, I'd also like to do a quick shout out to Betty's sister Hannah, who was the first runner up. Um, in the in the Duke uh, qualifying bee that happens here in Durham and as I just told them I like to think of them as the Venus and Serena of spelling <laughs> Proclamation honoring Betty Lehem Kloss Whereas Betty Lehem Kloss was born March 10th 2004 in Durham, North Carolina to Willie and Almez Kloss and Whereas Betty is a rising eighth grade student at Lucas Middle School in Durham, North Carolina and whereas Betty has been the winner of the Duke University Regional Spelling Bee and has represented Durham in the Scripps National Spelling Bee three consecutive times in 2014, 2015, and 2016. And whereas in the 2016 Scripps National Spelling Bee, Betty advanced to the final round and finished in 15th place overall. And whereas Betty's qualifying vocabulary test scores for the final round indicated that she had mastered 90% of the list of extremely difficult vocabulary words. And whereas Betty is the first speller in, the histor in history from the Duke University Regional Bee to advance to the final round of the Scripps National Spelling Bee. And whereas Betty enjoys dancing, zip lining, bicycling, skating, hiking in the woods, sledding, deep sea fishing, academic competitions, playing the bass clarinet and the clarinet and reading, and whereas Betty plans to attend Duke University, obtain an engineering degree, and pursue a career as an architect and designer, now therefore I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, and on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim September 6, 2016, as Betty Lehem Kloss Day in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to take special note of this observance. Betty is a role model for our youth and a treasured asset to our community. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, the 6th day of September, 2016. Um, I'd just like to say a few words before I go back. So first, I would like to thank um, Durham Public Schools and Durham for supporting me in the spelling bee and also to Duke University for sponsoring me to this journey. And also I'd like to thank all my supporters, even if you just happened to watch me on ESPN and said, oh, I'm going to root for her. I thank you so much for all that you've done. Also, a thank you to friends and family who came out to see me at the Spelling Bee, whether it was on TV or actually in Washington. I thank you guys a lot for that too. And I'd also like to give a thanks to my dad. 
who has been really supportive, and he will literally tell anyone he sees on the street about me and the spelling bee. <laughs> also, I would like to thank my sister, who, of course, is the one who really inspires me to be better every time because she's like a competitor in a friendly way and she pushes me to do better. And last of all, I would like to thank my mom. She is my coach, she is my rock, and she rocks my world. Willie and I uh, served on the board of directors of mechanics and farmers bank, so we have a close friendship that goes far back. And uh, his daughter's right. Uh, he, anytime he talks about his daughter, he talks about the spelling bee. And well, he should. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we, we have four of the proclamations to present, and the first one uh, relates to the Golden Leaf Award to the city of Durham. As probably many of you know, a lot of changes have taken place uh, in the city of Durham, particularly in the downtown area with building re um, renovations, adaptive reuse. Uh, we've got some new buildings going up. And it's been a true public-private partnership in what we've been able to accomplish in, in the city, particularly in terms of the revitalization. And I, I'm pleased to say that uh, the city of Durham has tried to participate in many ways in this revitalization not the least of which is dealing with our own structures that we have. So this uh, recognition that we're receiving this evening uh, speaks to the fact that earlier this year, nine properties were honored for excellence in design and preservation of their properties during the 2016 Durham Golden Leaf Awards for Community Appearance. The awards program is sponsored by the Durham City County Appearance Commission, Keep Durham Beautiful, Inc., and the Durham City County Environmental Affairs Board on its excellence in design, preservation, and stewardship of the natural and built environment. Judging of the awards was done by an independent panel of local professionals representing architect, landscape architect, development, and arts community. The People's Choice Awards were selected by public vote from the nominees under consideration for any of the award categories for 2016. Over 4,500 votes were cast for this award category. The award recipients were revealed at a reception in April, and the City of Durham was honored to receive two awards for the recently completed major renovation of City Hall, the facility that we're in tonight, an award for adaptive reuse and a People's Choice Award. The project has been celebrated for how it brings City Hall into the 21st century through the use of green technologies and a dramatic reinvention of the building's character. So on behalf of the Durham City Council, I want to extend my congratulations and appreciation for the efforts of our project partners. And I'm going to ask them to join me, R&D Architects and Belfort Baiting Construction, as well as our General Services Department project managers, John Pace Wills and Doreen Cephalisi, for their vision and stewardships. And I want to thank them for the dedication of this team. And today's City Hall is more energy efficient, more attractive, and more welcoming for our citizens. And I'm honored on behalf of the Durham City Council to accept the Golden Leaf Award certificates from our project team representatives. And I, if you could join me, Charles Nicholson with R&D Architects and Jeff Bean with Balfour Beatty Construction. I, I'm going to turn the microphone over to them for any comments they want to make. Are we going to be pizzas? You're going to yes, pizzas, huh? Yeah. We've got to find a special place. We can find a special place. Okay, great. Well, let everybody sit down. The awards. This is great. 
Thank you. One of the um, things that we've done is we've been able to partner on the, this project with Gloria Shealy with the Danielle Company, and she wasn't in that group, but she was an important part of making this project successful, and just appreciate the work we have been able to do. Charles and I have worked twice in City Hall, doing the inside and the outside, and it's, I think, made it a better place. Thank you. The next award is an award that basically says, imagine a day without water in Durham. And this is a proclamation, and we want to present this to Sidney Miller, Water Resources Planning Manager from the Water Management Department. We've got a friend here, right? <laughs> All right, great. Uh, the proclamation speaks to the fact that whereas water is our most valuable and natural resource, and one that is absolutely vital to the quality of life for all citizens of the city of Durham and Durham County, whereas Durham citizens and businesses use nearly 27 million gallons of fresh, high-quality water every day, whereas dedicated city employees work every day to ensure delivery of this valuable commodity by careful management of the water supplies, vigil vigilant operation of the treatment facilities, and attentive maintenance of the distribution systems. And whereas the critical infrastructure and investment needed to deliver this precious resource are too often overlooked, misunderstood, and unappreciated. Whereas changes in our climate due to extreme weather events are likely to place additional strains and pressures on our water supplies, whereas investing in our drinking and wastewater system will now ensure a healthy and prosperous Durham community for many generations to come, now, therefore, I, William B. Bell Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, recognizing that water is essential to our quality of life and economic competitiveness, proclaim Thursday, September 15, 2016, as Imagine a Day Without Water in Durham, and call on all our citizens to consider the value of water for each individual, the community, and the economy of our city, and the hope that we will never have to live a day without water. I further challenge all citizens to learn how to protect our waters from pollution, practice, water efficiency and conservation in our daily lives, support efforts for improved water and sewer infrastructure, and become informed and involved in local water issues. Witness, witness my hand in Corporate Civil City of Durham. This is the sixth day of September 2016. I'm going to present this proclamation and of course you have opportunity to make comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Bell and Council. I'm honored to accept this proclamation on behalf of the more than 300 employees of the Department of Water Management who provide water and wastewater services to our customers 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Our department's goal is to ensure that each and every time our customers turn on their taps, clean, safe drinking water flows out. When we imagine an entire day without water, many of us think about how we would miss our morning showers or coffee, drinking water during the day, or miss being able to flush our toilets. We're now producing a few short, fun videos that illustrate some of these ideas. However, a day without water would be much more serious. Our fire department wouldn't be able to fight fires, local businesses would shut down, medical facilities would be impacted, and the list goes on. We are encouraging Durham residents to pledge to give up just one item or one action that relies on water for the entire day of September 15th. We have a special contest going on now with several chances to win a prize for participants. Durham citizens of all ages can take the pledge on our website at www.durhamsaveswater.org and be entered to win one of five home water conservation kits and the grand prize, a brand new rain barrel. We have instructions for signing the pledge and links on Facebook and Twitter. And while you are there, be sure to like and to follow us. We also hope you'll take time to watch and share our videos and imagine what you would miss most on a day without water. Water is essential for making Durham a great place to live, work, and play. Thanks for your ongoing support. Uh, 
could officers keep those doors closed while we're going through this, if you don't mind? Thank you. Next, we have a presentation to Charcot Marie Tooth Disease Awareness Month Proclamation. And Lee Littenwater, is she, Walters, are they present? You're, if you join me, you don't mind. Member of the CMT Association. And this was really new to me, and I, uh, when the information was presented, I had to take a look at it again myself. But uh, let me read, it speaks to the wearer's charcoal marie tooth, known as CMT disease, as an inherited neurological disorder affecting 2,500 people in the United States, where CMT affects over 2.8 million people worldwide, and approximately 100 children and adults are in Durham where some CMT symptoms are not diagnosed until months or years after birth, those diagnosed with CMT suffer from difficulty walking and maintaining balance, clumsiness, stumbling, and numbness in the arms, legs, hands, and feet, whereas there are, no treat there are no treatments available that will stop or slow down the progression of the disease, and there is little funding available for CMT research and support, where CMT Disease Awareness Month provides an opportunity for families who live lives have been affected to celebrate life and to remember loved ones loss, to honor dedicated health professionals, and to meet others and know that they are not alone. Whereas the establishment of CMT Tooth Disease Awareness Month will also provide the opportunity to increase public awareness about CMT. Now therefore I, William B. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim separate 2016 at CMT Awareness Month, and witness my hand the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina. This is the sixth day of September 2016. And I'm going to present this. And of course, if you have comments or care to say more, we appreciate it. Thank you. Mayor Bell and City Council and guests. Um, Mayor Bell said it perfectly. He'd never heard of it before. Thank you on behalf of the residents of Durham and the CMT Association for this proclamation. Most likely, until now, you've never heard of CMT. Although you may have seen the signs of the progressive weakness and peripheral neuropathy in me or any of the hundred other residents of Durham that have CMT. In September, community members nationwide step up to raise, to raise awareness of CMT. Through this proclamation, Durham's community awareness is being raised. Thank you so much. And last but not least, we have a proclamation uh, heralding Hispanic Heritage Month. And I'd like to present it to James E. Davis, Jr., who's the manager of Neighborhood Improvement Services of the Human Relations Division. And it reads, whereas National Hispanic Heritage Month is celebrated annually from September 15th through October 15th to celebrate the histories, cultures, and contributions of American citizens of ancestry from Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central and South America, whereas persons of Hispanic and Latin heritage have had and continue a profound and positive influence in the city of Durham, whereas the theme for the 2016 National Hispanic Heritage Month is honoring our heritage, building our future, whereas the Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee was established in 2002 to promote cultural understanding and inclusion and became an official committee of the city of Durham by the unanimous vote of the City Council on October 5, 2015, whereas today many Hispanic Americans are thriving but others are still struggling to overcome obstacles including language and cultural barriers as well as discrimination, whereas the City of Durham is committed to seeking to improve existing opportunities and to open new doors for Hispanic and Latino residents in the City of Durham, 
Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim September 15, 2016 through October 15, 2016 as Hispanic Heritage Month in Durham, and hereby urge our citizens to honor the distinct heritage of the Hispanic community and their contributions to our city, state, and nation by participating in relevant ceremonies, activities, and programs. And witness my hand, Corporate City Seal of the City of Durham, this is the sixth day of September 2016. I will present this proclamation and, of course, for any comments you may have. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, I had some prepared words. I think I'm going to try to speak from the heart for the most part. Um, the Neighborhood Improvement Services Department and the Human Relations Division, we're deeply honored to accept this proclamation um, to honor Hispanic Heritage Month, and we're very honored to serve as the liaison for the Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee. Um, but we know that there are still some barriers to equal access and equal opportunities. So the Mayor's Hispanic Latino Community is working to build bridges and tear down walls or anyone who may want to put up a wall or a fence to block these opportunities to equal access and opportunities elsewhere, not just housing, not just employment, not just health, but any way in which we enjoy the justice and liberty for all um, that we pledge allegiance earlier this evening. Everyone who is in Durham should also enjoy those justices and liberties. Um, so with that, I say thank you very much to the mayor and to the council for establishing um, the Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee. And as they say, with other um, opportunities to celebrate um, different cultures, um, this shouldn't be just a one month celebration and honor. I don't know if we've reached the limit uh, for this room. If we have not, could you let persons in and then close the doors so we can continue the meeting? Those persons that want to come in, I'm asking them to come in now. First, ask so there are any announcements by members of the council. Recognize Council Moffitt, Councilman Davis. Yes, thank order. you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first, I have two. The first is that the Human Relations Commission meets monthly. It's meeting this evening. Council Member Johnson and I serve as the council liaisons to the commission. Norris Wicker has been a long time and dedicated member of the HRC. He brought passion and an important voice to the discussions there. I learned today that he recently passed away. I'd like for us to take a moment of silence to remember his life and the contributions to the city of Durham. Thank you. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, the city manager's leadership, working together with the county manager in arranging for racial equity training for the staff of both offices I've heard along, that along with the manager's office staffs, all department heads participated, as well as um, members of the judiciary, the district attorney's office, and members of the community. Tom, I want to thank you for your leadership on this crucial issue. And um, I'd like to ask, uh, in a, two weeks at our next action meeting, that you give us a brief report on the activities and what you see as potential impacts. I'll be curious to hear how it went. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Recognize Councilman Davis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A couple of announcements also. I'd like to uh, let everyone know about a very special meeting of the Durham Crime Cabinet on this coming Friday at noon. Uh, we plan to have our new police chief um, there to introduce her to the cabinet, but also to have a panel discussion that would include the chief along with the sheriff, along with the chiefs of police at North Carolina Central, Durham Technical Community College, 
and Duke University, along with the security director for the Durham Public Schools. And we are calling this panel discussion, uh, well, this panel discussion will be centered around the safety, security, and the protection of Durham's youth. So we're hoping that uh, we will have an interesting discussion about ways that we can indeed deal with our young people. Um, and it should be a wonderful way for the community to come out to listen uh, and learn about the ways that we are uh, working to prevent crime. Uh, secondly, I want to ask you to mark your calendars, calendars uh, for Saturday, September the 17th. We'll be holding a um, housing resource fair, and that's being sponsored by the Housing Task Force of the Mayor's uh, Poverty Reduction, I'm sorry, the Transformation in 10 uh, is the new name for that uh, venture. So I'm hoping that we will in invite all of you to come out. This is really designed to allow people who wish to own homes to learn about the process and to uh, deal with a strategy uh, that would allow them to uh, become homeowners. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilman Davis. Are there any other announcements, comments by members of the council? Uh, if not, uh, we'll proceed with the priority items. First, the city manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. I have one priority item this evening, which is agenda item number 16, the utility extension agreement to serve Fendall Farms subdivision, formerly known as Doc Nichols subdivision. Uh, request this item be referred back to the administration and the Public Works Department. That's all I have this evening. Thank you. Mr. Proctor, move in second discussion. Hearing none, call a question. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Thank you. Recognize the city attorney for any priority items. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. Likewise, city clerk. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council, as you might, you all should know that on Thursday, uh, September the 1st, 2016, Reverend Mills delivered to the city clerk's office petitions containing signatures of persons requesting that the Durham Rescue Mission be excluded from the Golden Belt Local District, Historic District, and I have them. Let the record note the clerk's comments. It's been properly moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, we open the vote. Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Okay. Uh, I'm going to make an adjustment in the agenda before we proceed. Uh, I suspect that many of you are here for the item 21 Golden Belt Local Historic District and Preservation Plan, which is a public hearing matter. Uh, we also have two other public hearing matters uh, below that, and the city managers requested if we might be able to move those ahead. That's 22, which is a modification of the city's housing code, and item 23, modification of the city's non-residential building code. Those items will come after uh, item 20, which is a consolidated annexation, ACAL Creek Phase 2 and 2A. Uh, we'll now proceed with the uh, agenda. For those of you who may not attend our meetings, the consent agenda consists of items that may be approved with a single vote if a city council person or a member of the public chooses to remove an item. Uh, the item is removed and discussed later in the agenda. And I read the heading of each one of the consent agenda items. Okay, uh, item one is approval of city council minutes. Item two is universal release of NCR 16 restrictive covenants and reversions. Item three is municipal election process. Item four is Durham Orange Light Rail Transit Corridor Plan. Item five is contract amendment between the city of Durham and SunTrust Mortgage Inc. Item six is housing authority of the city of Durham request for city loan subordination. Item seven is an ordinance to change parking fees, and I'll pull that item. Item eight is an ordinance to authorize metered parking spaces. Item nine is installation of signalized pedestrian upgrades in Durham. Item 10 is water treatment plant residuals engineering services contract amendment number two. Item 11 is Brown and Williams water treatment plants residuals handling project construction contract award to Crowder Construction Company. Item 12 is the bid report for July 2016. Item 13 is proposed reimbursement agreement and temporary construction easement between LW Apartments, LLC, and the City of Durham for construction 
of a pedestrian pathway and public improvements entitled the Great Loop in Durham Central Park. Item 14 is an item that can be found on the general business agenda. Item 15 is water only utility extension agreement to serve 8201 Farrington Mill Road. Item 16 has been referred back to the administration as a utility extension agreement to serve Fiddle, Fiddle Farms sub subdivision, formerly known as Doc Nichols subdivision. Item 17 is 2015 2016 Recreation Advisory Commission report. Items 18 to 23 are items that can be found on the general business agenda as public hearings. Item 25 is the Housing Authority of the City of Durham funding request for Section 8 program. I would entertain a motion for the approval of the consent agenda items with the exception of item 7 and item 16. Mr. Mayor, just briefly, item number 3, the municipal <coughs> election process. I believe that matter at our last work session was uh, continued to the upcoming work session later this week and is likely on the agenda in error this evening. Would make a motion to strike that matter since I believe it is okay. properly on the agenda for this Thursday's work session for our group discussion on that matter. All right. Uh, I'd like to note that. Uh, entertain a motion on the consent Senate agenda item. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? And close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Uh, we'll now move to the general business agenda. Item 14 is 2016 Durham Holiday Parade Report. I'd like to move that item, Mr. Mayor. I'll second that motion. It's been properly moved and second. Is a discussion on item? Hearing none, call to question. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Uh, recognize uh, we're on the general business agenda. These are public hearings. Uh, the first one is item 18, consolidated annexation, Farrington Place at South Point slash 7221 Farrington Road. Good evening, Jacob Wiggins with the planning department. Um, <clears throat> I would like to state that all public hearings items before you tonight um, have been notified in accordance with the state law and affidavits um, indicating you such are on file with the planning department. Uh, this item is a request for utility extension agreement, um, voluntary annexation petition, and zoning map change um, received from Grayson Dayer Homes for approximately five and a half non-contiguous acres located on Farrington Road. If this request is, a, is approved, the applicant proposes to construct six single family residential lots at the subject site and has requested a zoning designation of residential suburban 20. The development plan associated with this request commits to the following single family homes, no mass grading or clear cutting during construction, dedication of public right of way and site access points. Uh, Planning Commission recommended approval by a vote of 11 to 0 on June 14, 2016 for this item. Budget and Man Management Services Department performed a fiscal analysis which indicated that the request is likely to be revenue positive upon annexation. And Public Works and Water Management performed the utility impact analysis which indicated that there is existing capacity in the City of Durham water and sewer mains for this use. Um, staff recommends that the council approve the utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation petition, and initial zoning. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. You've heard the staff report. This is a public hearing. I would ask first other questions on this item by members of the council. I recognize Councilman Shul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wiggins. Yes, sir. Uh, I, first of all, I just wanted to note that I appreciated the commitment by the developer to, for no mass grading on this site. Uh, I think that's a great thing. Uh, but I had some questions about the tax commitments that maybe you can answer for me. On the tax commitments, there's a commitment of 20 additional feet of right-of-way along F Farrington Road. Mm -hmm. Will there be a sidewalk constructed there, and is that noted in the development plan? Um, hold just one moment, and let me get my hands on that, and I can let you know. Thank you. And Mr. Wiggins, while you're at it, my other question involves is there a bike lane also being provided uh, as was requested by the uh, BPAC? Yes, sir.
Uh, Councilman Schul, so at this time, it does not appear that the applicant is providing the bicycle lane as requested, uh, nor at this time have they committed to a sidewalk. Um, and it is possible at the time of site plan a sidewalk could be required. Um, that is not necessarily typical for single family residential construction. It's not necessarily typical for single family residential construction. Is that what you said? <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, is the developer present? I guess, Mr. Mayor, when the developer comes up, I'll have a question for them on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Yes, sir. Are there other questions by members of the council? If not, let me ask, uh, structure this, are there any persons that want to speak for this item other than the developer? Is anyone who wants to speak against this item? In that case, uh, if the developer's present, you can, you, is the developer present for this project? Well, if the developer's not present, I'm going to close the public hearing and the record to reflect that, that no one else wanted to speak either for or against. I'll close the public hearing and matters back before the council. Second. It's been properly moved and second. It's open now for questions. Well, that's Councilman Schuler. I guess I don't have any questions. The developer's not here to answer them. Let me just say I'm disappointed they're not here to answer them. Uh, and uh, they usually we expect that the developer will be here. Uh, my objections are not such that I will vote against this, but uh, it is something I hope that you will let this developer know that. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, entertain action on the item. It's been properly moved and seconded in further discussion. Hearing on Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? You close the vote? It passes seven to zero. Thank you. We'll move to item nineteen. <laughs> Mayor Bell, we need to you need to uh, vote on the consistency statement. Move the consistency statement. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. And thank you, Madam Clerk, for reminding me. We move to item 19, Consolidated Annexation, Durham Public Schools Elementary School. Thank you, Jacob Wiggins again with the Planning Department. Um, this is a request for a utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation and initial zoning request um, has been received from Durham Public Schools for six contiguous parcels located along Scott King Road, um, approximately 49 and a half acres. If this request is approved, uh, the applicant is eventually intends to construct a public elementary school at the subject site. Um, the applicant has requested an initial zoning designation of residential rural, Falls Jordan B, which is an exact translation of the existing county zoning. Budget man management services performed a fiscal impact analysis, which indicates that the re request will likely be revenue positive upon build out. Uh, public works and water management performed a utility impact analysis and have determined that the existing City of Durham water main has capacity for the proposed use. The site will initially be served by the Durham County sewer system. Staff recommends that the council approve the utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation petition, and initial zoning, and I'm certainly happy to answer any questions you may have. Again, this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. You've heard a staff report. Are there questions, comments by members of the council? Recognize Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Wiggins, could you explain the sewer plans a little bit? It, it sounds like initially the sewer system, the sewer is going to be attained through the construction of a private pump station connected to the county sewer system, mm -hmm. and then later land is, and then land is being dedicated for the construction of a city pump station related infrastructure so that this development can be connected to the city sewer system at a later date, is that right? Yes, sir. So why is that happening in two steps? Um, Initially, the basin that they're in is drains into the county sewer system. Um, I would have to defer to Durham Public Schools as to uh, the second step on that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Steve Madeline with the Durham City County Planning Department. Uh, the short answer to your question, Council Member Schull, is that the existing sewer uh, pump station in the stagecoach area is pretty much at capacity at this point. So it was viewed as a temporary connection until a long-term solution could be made that would allow for it to be pumped to the Farrington Road. That's why they pay you the big bucks? 
Thank you very much, Steve. Include your questions. Again, this is a public hearing. I would ask uh, for the record, does anyone want to speak on this item, either for or against? Does anyone want to speak on this item? This is a public hearing, either for or against. Uh, let the record reflect that no one asked to speak on this item, either for or against. I will declare the public hearing to be closed. Matters back before the council. Move it. Second. There's been a and moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. We'll move to item 20. The consistency statement. A uh, consistency statement. Sorry about that. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. <laughs> item 20, consolidated annexation, Acal Creek phase two and two A. Thank you, Jacob, again, Jacob Wiggins, again with the planning department. This is a request for utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and initial zoning um, for four contiguous acres along Dual Air Drive and approximately one contiguous acre on Herndon Road um, for a total of nine parcels. Uh, the, the site is currently vacant. If approved, the applicant intends to construct single family residential homes on these parcels. Um, the applicant has requested an initial zoning designation of residential suburban 20, Falls Jordan B, which is the least intense zoning district um, based upon the development tier and the size of the lot. Budget Management Services performed the fiscal analysis, which indicated that this request would be revenue positive upon completion, and Public Works and Water Management performed the utility impact analysis, which indicated that the existing sur City of Durham water and sewer mains have capacity for the proposed development. Staff recommends that the Council approve the utility extension agreement, annexation petition, and initial zoning, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Again, this is a public hearing matter. The public hearing is open. I would ask that there are questions by members of the council or the staff report. I recognize Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If we're voting for this, well, let's just say, in general, we, our policy has been to try not to create satellites for reasons of which we're all aware, including the difficulty of providing fire and police protection and so forth. And the staff has recommended this on the basis that this area will soon grow and that this satellite will then be brought into the city. Would you say that as a true characterization? Yes, sir. What is it that gives you confidence that that will happen? Um, given the existing development, there is a subdivision to the south of this um, proposed project, which currently has city water and sewer, even though they are within the county's jurisdiction. There's a recently completed subdivision along the other end of Dudelayer Drive, which is in the city. Um, and given the, the Scott King Road Public Elementary School, which was just noted, is in this area. So staff has seen more applications in this area, so we Great. believe at this time. Thank you, Mr. Wiggins. Yes, sir. Other council questions? If not, are there persons in the audience that want to speak on this item who have not signed up either for or against? Uh, let the record reflect that no one asked to speak on this item, either for or against. I will declare the public hearing to be closed. Matters back before the council. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. It's been, it's been properly moved and second. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. We'll move to item 22, which is modification of the city's housing code. Mr. Mayor, City Council, my name is Faith Gardner. I'm the Housing Code Administrator with Neighborhood Improvement Services. We're requesting that City Council adopt the proposed ordinance amending the Housing Code found in Chapter 10, Article 6 of the Durham City Code. I'm available to answer any questions that you may have. 
Let me ask first of the council members, are there questions on this item? Mr. Mayor, I would say just for the record that council received a presentation on these changes at the work session. It may not be clear about that, but you, you have already reviewed those at the work session. Thank you. All right, I recognize Councilman Schul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Faith, first of all, I think these changes are great, and thank you all for doing such a thorough job and having such a good process, which you described, to bring these to us. Um, what happens when one of our inspectors, so, so there was, there was um, several things about lead paint in here, and so what happens when one of our inspectors sees chipping paint in an old house that was likely painted prior to 1978. What is the process that the inspector then would go through? Um, how often does this kind of thing get reported to the health department? How common is this and so forth? Um, there are a number of houses in Durham that are older than 1978, which is kind of the break point for lead paint. Um, we would initiate an inspection, we would cite the violation for the peeling paint, and we would do our standard code enforcement process. Uh, in addition to that, we would notify the state uh, Health and Human Services Health Hazard Control Unit to alert them that uh, there is a house that we've cited that has uh, led possible uh, instances of lead paint. Um, we would certainly notify the state if we actually saw someone actively scraping a house um, and not using the certified methods um, that need to be used. Uh, this, the code change would also include in our code text information about that health hazards control unit so it would alert an owner that, in fact, there are regulations around lead paint at the state level. How common would you say it is that one of your inspectors might feel the need to report this to, a, to a, a, the, the state health authorities or the local health authorities? Um, our inspectors are not normally on site when the activity is actually mm -hmm. occurring. Um, so in the past, we have not uh, contacted the state particularly very often because we're not there when that activity is occurring. Um, as we learn more about um, the importance of uh, lead, uh, say, taking lead seriously and lead hazards, um, we'll now be able to be more active in alerting owners uh, when they're first sighted that they need to take action uh, to make sure that they're practicing lead safe ha uh, practices. Thank you. Um, how do we, so one of the questions that has come up a lot lately for me is um, impoverished homeowners who are needing to make repairs and can't afford them. And we're, of course, the council is thinking about that a lot right now, but how do we work with impoverished homeowners who are facing expensive uh, code remediation, uh, or at <coughs> least expensive to them? Yeah, thank, thank you for that question. Um, we're, NIS is a regulatory agency. Uh, we're, we, do, we do code enforcement. Um, we do, however, make every effort to work with owners um, who have circumstance. In this case, the circumstance would be uh, difficulty in actually paying for repairs. Um, so we offer extensions of time. We work with the owner to give them additional time to collect resources. Um, and we also have, in the past, our experience has been we've worked with our community engagement division and they can oftentimes work with an owner to find a nonprofit group or other group of folks who will assist an owner in getting repairs made. Our community development department also has an emergency uh, repair program 
So if the owner is elderly or disabled, we will refer them to that department so that they can uh, apply for help through that program. Thank um, you. Yeah, um, so just want to say to our city manager that this makes me think again about how urgent it is that we get our small repair program up and running at scale um, so that we can keep financially strapped uh, impoverished homeowners, many of them elderly and disabled, as you mentioned, Faye, in their homes, uh, especially when our code enforcement is causing them to have to make these repairs. Um, so um, I know that we're, um, um, Mr. Manager, we're waiting for soon to hear from the administration on scaling up that program, and, and I hope we can uh, do it sooner rather than later because I, I do think this is such an important uh, step that we need to take. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Faith. Mr. Sh Mr. Schill, I would like to add that um, I talked about some of the steps we take. Um, it, it's not enough. Uh, it, it doesn't meet the need that we have. So thank you. Are there other questions by members of the council? Recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, just want to ask the manager to have staff look at how we're using the penny for housing money, and perhaps that can be used, as I've said in the past, to help with housing rehabilitation efforts. Thank you. Are there other comments, questions by members of the council? Uh, this is a public hearing. I would ask, uh, is there anyone who wants to speak on this item? Uh, no one has signed up. Uh, is there anyone that wants to speak on this item? I'll let the record reflect that no one asked to speak on this item. I'll declare the public hearing to be closed. Matters back before the council. Move the item. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Moved item 23, modification of the city's non-residential building code. Mr. Mayor, Council, um, I'm asking, uh, we're asking that the uh, Council adopt the proposed ordinance amending the non-residential building code found in Chapter 10, Article 7, Division 2 of the Durham City Code uh, with a revision. Um, the uh, City Attorney's Office staff uh, made us aware just this afternoon that we have a um, text, uh, we left some text out, and so we are requesting um, that you all adopt this revised non-residential building code. The revision is to uh, section 10-304F, excuse me, 10-304I number 4 to read, flexible cords shall not be used as a substitute for the fixed wiring run through the holes in walls, ceilings, or floors, run through doorways, windows, or similar openings attached to building surfaces concealed behind building walls, ceilings, or floors. So that uh, last phrase is correct in the matrix, uh, but it is, uh, we're asking that that be included in the um, ordinance, proposed ordinance. Just, uh, and, and we will uh, provide that uh, complete information to the council after the meeting or tomorrow so that everybody has that record. Thank you. I'm going to close the public hearing if there's no comments, uh, no matter it's back before the council again. Yeah. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close, close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Now move to item 21, Golden Belt Local Historic District and Preservation Plan.
Good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of council. I'm Lisa Miller with the Durham City County Planning Department. Um, we're here for a public hearing for the case X1000009, the establishment of a Golden Belt Local Historic District overlay and accompanying preservation plan. Um, before I provide you with a brief uh, overview and background on the project, I just wanted to note that notice has been provided as required by law and affidavits are on file for this case. Um, just very briefly, uh, this process was begun in 2010 when a uh, number of Golden Belt residents submitted a petition uh, as allowed by the Unified Development Ordinance to begin the process of establishing a Golden Belt local historic district. The requested boundary for consideration was the National Register Historic District Boundary for Golden Belt, uh, which was established in 1985. Um, the Preservation Commission reviewed this petition uh, and the National Register nomination and determined uh, at that time that it was, uh, had the requisite integrity and historic significance to pursue uh, the preparation of a preservation plan and uh, consideration of establishing a local district. Uh, so coming ahead to 2015 in June, um, the MDM historical consultants were hired uh, by the planning department uh, to conduct the survey work, put together a preservation plan, and propose a boundary for the proposed local district. Uh, an initial public meeting was held in July of 2015 to introduce the residents and stakeholders to the process as it was beginning. The consultants in the fall of 2015 uh, conducted their survey work, researched every building, structure, and site, and photographed uh, within that boundary and slightly outside of it, um, and wrote a history and description of the district for the preservation plan and delineated a recommended boundary based on all of their research and survey work. Uh, after the draft of the preservation plan and the uh, consultant's recommended boundary were compiled, there were two public me uh, meetings held to get feedback from the stakeholders and community on both the plan and the boundaries, those were held in January and March of this year. Uh, to this date, we've now had two public hearings uh, to provide recommendations to you all in making a decision on this case. In April 2016, the Historic Preservation Commission held a public hearing and voted to approve uh, the both plan and recommended boundary. It was a vote of four to zero. And in June of 2016, the Planning Commission uh, held a public hearing, again approved, uh, recommended approval to you all of the plan and proposed boundaries of a vote of seven to four. Um, I will note that both the consultants and planning staff have heard concerns from various parties regarding where the boundary is drawn for the district. They're briefly described in your staff report. Um, obviously, I'm happy to answer any questions about the project. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, again, this is a public hearing. Item, uh, we've heard a brief staff report on the proposed preservation plan. Uh, let me go first to members of the council to ask if there are questions or comments that any of you might have. I have one question. I recognize the mayor pro tem. Just for clarity, and there are some people in the audience who might need this clarity as well. What are the economic benefits of this designation? I can speak anecdotally to that, um, but I don't have uh, research that I can show you. Um, there are both, uh, the local district has both benefits and uh, it's both carrot and stick. Uh, so it has the benefit of making sure that changes that occur within the district are more predictable, which can both, uh, there's been some research I know of uh, one study done in Greensboro where it has shown to stabilize property values in times of economic downturn um, and to help property values rise um, more so than a National Register district could. Um, there are some cost and uh, time uh, implications of going through the process. Uh, planning staff has been working to try and minimize those and make them more predictable with our new local review criteria and working with the Historic Preservation Commission. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but hopefully it gets at it. You're the expert. That's good enough. <laughs> Thank you. Re recognize Councilwoman Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Lisa, I was wondering if you could 
speak briefly to um, whether the changes um, in the process to build new development in a historic district would impact um, plans of the rescue mission or any or other organization to build a larger structure like a community center, how they would be impacted, um, and whether that use would be in any way regulated by a historic district. Okay. Um, I will do my best to describe how the, res the February of this year adopted a review criteria deal with um, what's considered non-contributing property, so any property that's vacant where you're going to be building new construction is contributing or is considered a non-contributing property. Um, so first of all, the local historic district does not prescribe use. Uh, while it is a zoning overlay, the base zoning designations of RU5 or RS20 or what have you are what regulates what use is allowed on the property. So this doesn't impact that. Um, the local review criteria were rewritten in a way to clarify how historic and non-historic or contributing and non-contributing properties are dealt with. Um, the focus for new construction on non-contributing properties is on the scale, height, and mass of structures. Um, there are some sort of minimal uh, parameters for design and materials. Uh, and sort of entrance location and, and uh, setback is another one. So essentially what we'd be looking at um, or what the commission would be looking at with a new request um, would be trying to find something, uh, find whether something is compatible with the existing development. So within the Golden Belt neighborhood, um, one of the things that's been delineated in the plan is a distinction between the scale of residential development where the mill houses were located commercial development in that section and the mill village uh, within the sort of industrial complex. There's certainly a lot of differences in scale and placement. So uh, the plan calls for looking at your immediate uh, surroundings, which of those three parts of the district you're within, um, and then finding ways to be compatible with that. And compatibility is one term that's defined in the criteria in order to help people understand that it doesn't require that you uh, mimic historic construction, um, but essentially it's getting at the language from the state statute that uh, asks that new modifications not detract from the overall historic character of the district, and that's the goal with non-contributing properties. You finished? Recognize Councilman Marfin. So I heard you. I'm not sure that I completely understood you, so let me ask. Um, you talked about scale and massing, and you said that um, in the Golden Belt there was a variety of scale and massing, and that uh, a developer would look to the, and the Historic Preservation Commission would look to the near, nearby environment for more specifically the scale and massing issues. So the question that my colleague asked was the impact on the, uh, I think specifically was on the impact of the Durham Rescue Mission's ability to build, for example, a community center or large-scale building, would a large-scale building be pro, uh, uh, precluded from being able to be built on? If, I, I realize the underlanding use zone currently doesn't sure. allow it. They can't do it now, is it, I think. I'm not, not sure that that's the there, there would need to be an interpretation People on that, are moving behind you, so I must have said the wrong thing. So. <laughs> I, um, I think that question has not been sorted because oh. it depends on what, what one is proposing, whether that matches the definition of what a community center is in the ordinance and whatnot. Okay, all so. right, so yeah, I realize that we're not messing with the underlying use zone, so Correct. whatever they can do or can't do is set now, and, but would this impact their ability to do a, a project that might have some larger scale to it? Sure, um, so, it would have an impact on how such a building could be built. Um, I have looked through the criteria and looked, uh, uh, met with a site planner for the rescue mission and looked at sort of potential uh, program for a building um, and talked through ways that it could be uh, designed in order to be respectful of the scale around it. Uh, in, in the looking at it that I've done, and again, no formal plans have been submitted, so this was a you know, schematic conversation, but in looking at uh, how you would essentially hide the mass of a 
uh, large scale structure within the block, I, I believe it's possible given the amount of property that the rescue mission has um, in doing some very brief and rough calculations. So. Are there other council questions? Okay, let, let me suggest how we, we will proceed on this item. Um, this is a public hearing and uh, persons that have signed up to speak, uh, I will recognize them and we'll set a time limit. Uh, I first want to know, is that anyone who wishes to speak on this item that has not signed one of these yellow cards? All right. And you, you might ask those persons outside if you can ask the same question of them. Collect the cards. Huh? They said they can collect the cards in the bag. Did you have them walk out? Yeah, I'm not going to walk out. I want to find out if anybody wants to sign up. Because otherwise, this is who's going to be able to speak. Is, is there anyone that's outside in the area that wants to sign up, that wants to speak to that's not signed one of these cards? I see a lot of movement out there. Steve, could you ask the question, please? Okay. All right. Okay, we'll, we'll go with the persons that have signed up to speak. Uh, I have a total of 27 persons who want to speak in support of the proposal. I have 16 that wish to speak in opposition. I have three cards that have signed up but have not indicated whether they want to speak as proponents or opponents, so I'm going to call the name if you can tell me where you are on this issue. Marcus Howard, is Marcus Howard present? Are you a proponent or opponent? Are, are you a proponent or opponent of the, the plan? Okay, thank you. Um, Sylvester Williams. And Clay Walters. Is Clay Walters present? For, for, for the plan. Okay. O opposed to the plan. All right. So we now have 19 persons that are opposed and 27 that are proponents. Uh, I'm going to call the proponents first, followed by the opponents. And I know we've got a bunch of uh, letters over there, but they'll just be a part of the record. Uh, we don't yield time in this process. So in other words, uh, the time that we designate is the time that you have, and you can't yield your time for someone else. And we have a clock to the left, the clerk has, and it will denote the amount of time that you have. I'm going to initially ask persons to limit their remarks to two minutes on each one of these items, and then if we need to go back, we'll, we'll look at that later. So as I call your name, if you can come to the podium to, to the right, begin lining up, and at the appropriate time, uh, begin to speak. Uh, Catherine Johnson. Katherine Johnson, present. Uh, Sandra Bath, and I'll probably mispronounce some of these names, so you can correct me. Sandra Bath, is that person present? B A, is that? Batty. B A T T. B A T T. E. E. So we put that. No, battle. 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 Oh, Sandra Battle. Okay, we put that aside. Uh, John Martin, John Martin present. John Martin present. Uh, Susan Sewell, Sewell. Uh, Dedrina Friedman, I saw Dedrina Friedman. Mel Norton. James, is this Chavis? What? Well, is James Chavis here? You, you mark two different places. Are you an opponent or proponent? Opponent? Did you say opponent? Yeah. Mr. Mayor. 
Well, are you opposed to Okay, thank you. And, and the manager just leaned over me to make sure that we're uh, speaking the same language. The recommendation is to establish the, the, the district. So if you're for establishing the district, you are a proponent. You, if you're opposed to establishing the district, you're an opponent. Uh, so these people are for the district, one of you, Evans, is that correct? Uh, Michael Kortsmetter, Michael present, uh, Aretha Jackson, uh, Rob Emerson, uh, Daniel Thornton, E.I. Allison, Pete Katz, Matil Natalie Springs, Jordan Gaps, Ron, Ran Borden, Tall Madeline, Charles Gibbs, oh, Charles Gibbs is an opponent, um, Barbara Taylor, Regina King, Benjamin Filippo, Andrew Henson, Adele Hill, Tom Miller, Rama Dogba, Hot Dogba, and Eddie Belt. Okay, you remember your name. So as you come, if you again, if you again will state your name and address and then begin. Mr. Mayor. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Yes, sir, there was a little bit of confusion. I think that um, Mr. Chavis signed up as an opponent. Did you want him to wait till the opponent spoke? Yeah, the persons that are speaking now are proponents of for establishing the district. That's who's speaking now. So, so as you come forth, tell me if you are opposed or a proponent, and then state your name and address. Yes, ma'am. I'm in favor of care. this proposal. My name is Katherine Johnson. Okay. I live at 2504 Englewood Avenue. It's in the Watts Hospital Hillendale District, which is a uh, par par Pardon district. me. We're going to have to keep the door closed. We're going to have to keep the door closed to respect the persons that are speaking and respect the council so that we can hear what's being said. All right. I live in a historic district that's already been established, so I'm somewhat familiar with uh, the expectations of historic districts. Uh, I, over a number of years, I have paid attention to the proposals for historic districts and have observed that in many cases they're very positive, they help stabilize neighborhoods and offer opportunities for neighborhoods to work together to improve their situations. In this particular case, I would like to support the proposal as described by the consultants, which recommends not only following the overlay as initially proposed, but maintaining it and not accepting the properties that the Durham Rescue Mission would like to exclude because they, uh, the consultants at any rate, think that that would both be a detriment to the historic district and uh, in cases where it might be possible to make adjustments, they would be expensive and hard to carry out. So I stand in favor of this and I hope that the council will vote to approve it I thank you very much for your time, all the work you put into listening to people and reading our emails, and um, I appreciate all the work you do. Thank you. Good evening. My name is John Martin. I live at 401 East Trinity Avenue in Old North Durham, and I strongly support this local historic district. 
Part of the reason I support it is I used to live in Golden Belt and I helped uh, start the petition that started this, this process. The reason we started this process is because the Durham Rescue Mission had plans to close streets. They submitted plans to the planning department to close streets, to build a wall around a large compound and basically shut themselves off from the rest of the neighborhood and we said we don't like this. Now, of course, they're talking in totally different terms. But I would like to remind you that this is zoning. Nothing in zoning, as you well know, because you hear zoning cases every month, um, is set in stone. If they come to you with real plans for a real community center that is really going to serve the community and it requires a zoning change, you can make that in the future. But if you reject a local historic district now on the grounds that it might interfere with something that they might propose in the future, you're buying a pig and a poke. Now, I'll tell you why they're talking about a community center. It's because, although I support them building affordable housing um, in Golden Belt, um, th I don't support them building large buildings in Golden Belt because that's a residential neighborhood. Um, they have been circumventing the UDO, our zoning ordinance, um, for years. The UDO classifies a social service institution as one that provides treatment for those with psychiatric, alcohol, or drug problems. Um, or transient lodging or homeless sh shelter. That is forbidden in all residential neighborhoods. So how do they get around it? They hire the Morningstar law firm um, to call the buildings that they want to build something else. The last building they built they called um, a commercial dormitory. Now Granville Towers in Chapel Hill is a commercial dormitory. They're a social service institution. So I think we should have one standard, the UDO standard, for neighborhoods that are in the western part of Durham and in East Durham. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, my name is Rob Emerson. I'm a landscape architect. I'm a resident of Durham, 1202 North Gregson Street. I worked as a development consultant in Durham for nearly 20 years and I currently serve as president of the board of directors of Preservation Durham. With the rebirth of our downtown, development pressures on the outlying urban neighborhoods have increased. Modest working class homes, once occupied by teachers and workers, are being demolished or renovated in ways that render them unaffordable to most. Just east of downtown, the Golden Belt Mill Village faces these external threats, as well as one from within. Since the neighborhood was first listed on the National Register, <clears throat> 30 years ago, Durham Rescue Mission has acquired nearly a quarter of the residential lots. Fifteen of these are now vacant. We support the creation of a local historic district. Planning staff have worked hard to develop a common sense, tiered system of local design criteria, including reasonable and flexible guidelines for appropriate new construction. Preserving the street grid, using durable materials, and locating doors and windows on the street are not unduly burdensome criteria. As Habitat for Humanity has shown, historic homes can be renovated and new homes of quality can be built affordably. Four Habitat homes on Franklin Street are proudly owner-occupied, yet isolated from their neighborhood by vacant lots owned by Durham Rescue Mission. The only proposal we've seen from Durham Rescue Mission would have demolished many more homes closed portions of Franklin and Morning Glory, and created a large, inwardly focused campus behind a wall. We oppose that plan, but stand ready to work with the rescue mission and their neighbors to develop a better one that considers the area's historic urban context. We believe the establishment of a local district is the best tool to ensure that this collaboration happens and urge you to approve the Golden Belt Preservation Plan, including the consultant's recommended boundary. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Benjamin Filippo. I'm the Executive Director of Preservation Durham. I live at 2002 East Main Street, just a few blocks from the Durham Rescue Mission. What I want you to strongly consider is what a community center really is. 0.68 miles from where the Dur Durham Rescue Mission stands is a community center that the city, Duke, and others through a public-private partnership spent $14.9 million renovating the Holton Career and Resource Center. This provides free meals twice a month, senior programming, free computers, free gym access, and many other resources to the community 
It is a four minute bike ride from Golden Belt and the rescue mission. It is a 14 minute walk. I would argue very strongly that we already have a community center in the area that is convenient, that is accessible, that has no religious barriers or otherwise barriers for everyone and all Durhamites to access. I would strongly ask you to consider when Durham Rescue Mission proposes a community center, what on earth they're talking about. The other argument I would put forth is what kind of precedent do you want to set by allowing a private, religious, family-run nonprofit from excluding themselves from a district and for any other municipal policies that come forth, allowing another type of entity, whether it's a corporation, a development firm, whatever it might be, from excluding themselves on some vague grounds with no real plans to put forth, with the duplication of something that is very clearly already there, in which the county and city have already spent significant sums to renovate creatively a historic building, as is the Maureen Joy Charter School, the oldest charter school in the state of North Carolina, founded in 1997, another public-private partnership, and a free public good for the people in the area that serves as a beacon of hope for people in the neighborhood and allows people to enter that and provide a really excellent education to kids in a creative reuse historic preservation process that was not onerous and was functional and successful. And we have many other examples. Self-help is working on the same in the Andrew Avenue and Driver District right now. I urge you to accept this district as proposed fully. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Andrew Henson. Uh, I live on 2111 Ash Street uh, in Old East Durham, uh, also a few blo blocks from the Durham Rescue Commission. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Uh, for those in this room who reside in Durham, uh, I'm sure no, you, no doubt you have witnessed the rapid growth of our city. Um, and it's because of this rapid growth that we need now more than ever to protect the history of our city. In the past, historic preservation has been largely focused on more affluent neighborhoods. But tonight, we have a chance to recognize the significant contributions of the Golden Belt Mill Village to the history of our city. As for the Durham Rescue Mission, there is no evidence that the proposed design code will be prohibitive whatsoever to their community center in East Durham or any other designs they may have. The, re the renovations in the area speak to that. We already have, um, as was mentioned, Marine Joy. Uh, the buildings run by scientific properties on the corner of um, East Main and Elizabeth. These show that large structures can operate harmoniously in and be a partner with the surrounding community. Durham Rescue Mission is part of the Golden Belt neighborhood and should be embraced the neighborhood that it lives in and its history and not seek to be drawn out of it. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Mel Norton, and I live at 1102 Wall Street in the Golden Belt neighborhood. I'm here tonight to support recommendations by the city hired consultants, city planning staff, the city appointed HPC, the city appointed planning commission, all of which have endorsed the boundary for the historic district that's in front of you today. Um, since I already sent you a lengthy email, I'm going to keep my comments limited to two, two main points. First, for a relatively small neighborhood, there are a few large development opportunities left in our boundaries. On the west side, there are two large surface parking lots owned by Scientific Properties and Julio Cordoba, and we are heartened that there's been no opposition from those folks um, in regards to the district. On the east side, we have the Durham Rescue Mission, who has ambitious plans for continued expansion. It is no secret that they oppose the district. Um, but I believe that this opposition is fundamentally misguided. I think first it's important to underscore, as city staff has already mentioned tonight, that this will not change the underlying zoning. It will not impact what they can build in terms of use. Second, there's been a lot of speculation far and wide that this is going to astronomically increase um, development prices. Um, and I'd like to take the opportunity to, to address the affordable housing piece. Um, I have some examples here of the amazing work Habitat for Humanity has done in my neighborhood. Um, they've done over 12 houses. They are beautiful, high quality housing that enhances the history and cohesion of the neighborhood and created home ownership opportunities for people making less than 60% of the AMI. I would welcome this type of housing in my community. 
The second point I want to make is just in terms of equity. To date, historic preservation as a movement has disproportionately benefited and preserved the higher income neighborhoods on the west side of town. My neighborhood is a majority working class, mixed race community. And I would like the same assurances that a development that happens adjacent to us does so in a way that it respects the history and quality of life in our neighborhood. This boundary has been vetted. It will guide development in appropriate and contextual ways. And its adoption shows that the city is taking seriously the historic preservation of neighborhoods on the east side of town. I believe that there's a win-win here. I, I should have indicated from the outset, if you have written remarks, if you want to leave those, in the event you can't spend all your time, you're welcome to that. All right, James, these are people who are speaking in support. Are you speaking in support yes. of the plan? Yes. Okay. I'm speaking in support of the district. Mm -hmm. And I live in East Durham. I grew up in East Durham. So I know what that area has always been about. We need affordable housing in East Durham. And the only way we can get affordable houses, Reverend Mills, if you take some of that land and help make it affordable for the people that you are called to help. The rent over there is going up and people are getting pushed out. Home ownership or affordable is more better than a big tall building because our people need affordable homes. It was affordable in the past and it should stay affordable because that area would draw people to understand, Rebel Mills, what you have done in the beginning and what you can do now. Make that area more affordable homes and I assure you, you will continue to grow. Thank you. My name is Susan Sewell. I speak in support of the Golden Belt Historic District as drawn. Um, I am also speaking on behalf of Inner Neighborhood Council, and I wanted to thank the City Council for finally having this hearing. We had written you over two years ago concerned about the length of time between the time they filed in 2010 and this now hearing. So thank you for finally having it, and I support the neighborhood and all the hard work they've been doing for 20 years. 2904 Legion Avenue in proud member of Tuscaloosa Lakewood neighborhood. I'm sorry. Good evening. I am Rhonda Webb and this is my husband, Lynn Webb. We live at 1307 East Main Street. My husband is a retired fireman for the city. We have been married for 35 years and I live at um, one block from the Durham Rescue Mission and next, to, next door to two of their properties, 1305 and 1309. We are in between the two of them. We have raised three birth children, three adopted children, and three foster children. And I homeschooled all of, them, all of them, and they all have went to college. I have been a resident of East Durham community for over for 50 years. I moved to East Durham in 1966 with my divorced mother, my oldest brother, which was a college student, my other brother, which was nine, and my sister, which was 12. We grew up in the few gardens apartments. Yes, I went to the Edgemont Elementary School in the 1100 block of East Main Street. The steps are still there. My principal was Mr. Hill, and he would meet us right at the corner of Austin and East Main Street to walk us in front of the A&P store to walk us into our school. I grew up and married and bought a house in, on Main Street. Hmm? Uh, we bought a home right in between my husband's two aunt, um, aunt's houses, which she owned four properties on M Main Street. Ms. Ms. Webb, I, I, I hate to interrupt you. Uh, I made a mistake on my card. Okay, I just wanted to make sure yeah. you were an opponent. Okay. Yeah, right, thank I'm you. opponent, yes. Oh, I, I am for the historical. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, um, as I was saying, um, my block, which is the 1300 block, which is one block away from the Durham Cur Rescue Mission, you hear all these stories about um, people without homes, um, the uneducated, the, um, the drugs, the everything. But when I bought my home on East Main Street, 
five of the people in our block, which was the Joneses that own a, a, a bakery. Ms. Camp had two family care homes. I had a, a four-star daycare. Ms. Taylor uh, owned a cleaning business. We were all in the 1300 block, and that's far as I can go. But you can all stop by 1307. I can give you the stories and show you pictures of Thank the you. raccoons that live in one of their properties. Thank you. Hello, my name is Juanita Evans, and I live at 1210 Franklin Street, and I live um, right next to two empty lots that the Durham Rescue Mission has there. And I am just here to, uh, first of all, thank you for receiving my emails, for responding to my emails. I know you're busy schedule, but I really appreciate that. And just to let you know that I am in support of the local historic district, including the Durham Rescue Mission properties also. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. You're welcome. Good evening, everybody. My name is Danielle Thornton. I live at 1209 Franklin Street, and I'm here in support of the Golden Belt. Um, thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Aretha Jackson. I live at 1211 Franklin Street, and I'm in support of the Historical District. Hello, my name is Micah Kordsmeyer. I live at 911 Rome Avenue in Durham, um, and I uh, own property on Hyde Park in Old East Durham. Uh, first off, I want to thank uh, both the staff and the City Council for their close attention to this issue. I know it uh, can be a pretty complex one. Um, I just recently completed my term on the Historic Preservation Commission. I'm on the Board of Preservation Durham, uh, and I uh, am on the real estate development team of Self-Help, where we practice community development, uh, build affordable housing, and uh, focus on the existing neighborhood character and historic preservation in, in almost all of the work that we do. Uh, but I'm here to speak from my own experience. Uh, I just want to remind... Um, or at least point out that there's sort of two main tools for historic preservation in our communities. The first is to promote the preservation of actual structures through tax credits and property tax abatement. We do that with the National Register District, um, which helps mainly higher income people that can take advantage of uh, income tax credits. Uh, and we do that through local landmarks, uh, which also helps uh, mainly primarily benefits people that have the resources to individually identify their properties as historic. The other way that we protect um, historic properties is by protecting the character of neighborhoods and that's what we do through the local designation of historic districts and that's what really helps preserve the character of our historic neighborhoods the resources we have there and the people that live in them uh, and without those protections um, the neighborhood is susceptible to the pressures that you see already there now and will be used as arguments against it that there's vacant lots that the Alston Avenue widening will disrupt the neighborhood um, those are both reasons that the neighborhood needs the full protections of the historic district boundaries as recommended by the consultants, the Preservation Commission, and others. Uh, and finally, it gives the community a voice in the process so that they have a say in how their community will take shape over the years. And this is a community that doesn't have that voice in almost every decision as it is now. So I'm in favor of them having as much voice as possible. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. I brought this headlines from the news. Could, could you state your name, please? It indicates. Could, could you state your name and address? E. L. For the Allison. E. Livonia Allison. Some yes. people know me as. Yes. Did you take my minute? Your address. <laughs> 1315 McLaurin Avenue, Durham 27707. Homeowners are not at odds with the historic preservation. Commission. They're not at odds with the Durham Planning Commission. They're not at odds with the public Durham planning staff. So I'm here to ask you to think about the neighborhood. Persons who, but the homeowners, Durham Mission is at odds with all of those that 4 0, that 7 4. Homeowners need protection. We have a community over there that can be stabilized because the taxes and the federal government, they said historically you're going to have to do something and you're going to have to do it right. Developers don't do things right. 
People know that the Board of Adjustment has to fight always for community people. I'm just here, do the right thing, do the fair thing, do the just thing. Make these homeowners understand that you care about a community and help us get some more houses over there. We need to come together and get a pool of persons. Public school ought to have people building houses like Mr. Thornton used to do. Do the right thing, protect them. I'm not against what the mission has done, but they don't need to get any more land to get something more. As they're developers now. Watch out. Take care of the people. Fair, just, do the right thing. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Peter Katz. I live at 402 East Trinity, and I'm here to support the Golden Belt neighborhood. Um, and the historic district as drawn. I've seen the form emails that the rescue mission has sent, as have all of you, soliciting people to email you with claims that the historic district would add restrictions that would hinder plans to build a community center. Claims which I think are roundly contradicted by recent HPC approvals of such controversial projects as the city center and Greystone apartments. Surely you can do a community center if you can get those through. What's more, the propaganda put out by the Rescue Mission about the historic districts driving up housing costs, in my opinion, is bizarrely inaccurate. And in many places in Durham, historic districts are now the only thing which are just delaying teardowns of modest, affordable housing, um, which is being replaced with these giant spec homes that we're now seeing all over Durham. I think it's wrong that they would try to claim the opposite just to suit their own agenda. The other thing that you're going to hear is that um, these are just a bunch of vacant lots. What's the difference? And I'd like to ask why, after all these years, are they vacant lots? I understand this um, may not fit the rescue uh, mission's um, expansion plans, um, but I could also see how the neighborhood um, wouldn't necessarily embrace a uh, uh, acquisition plan based on perpetuating blight, despite the other good things that they do. So the bottom line is that none of us simply get to oppose our vision on Durham. And while the historic district isn't going to prevent the Millses from building a community center, if that is really what they intend to do, it will create a vehicle by which they will need to engage with other community voices and allow consideration for the neighborhood outside their fences. If that consideration is the thing which they seek to avoid, then that, in and of itself, I think is cause for alarm. I urge you to vote yes in favor of the Golden Belt Historic District with the boundaries as recommended by the City Planning Staff, the Historic Preservation Commission, and the Planning Commission. Thank you. Hello. My name is Natalie Spring. I live at 801 Cleveland Street, which is in the Cleveland Street Local Historic District, the oldest historic district in Durham. I also own property at 503 North Queen Street, which is in the proposed Cleveland Holloway Expansion Historic District, which will come before you sometime in the next six years, hopefully. Um, what I'm here to talk to you about tonight is how much it costs to work on a house in a historic district. I've done it with tax credits. I've done it without any sort of involvement other than the inspections department. And I've done it at Cleveland Street in my big, fancy, beautiful mansion house, uh, most recently, using the local historic district. I will be the first to admit I am one of the haves. I have money, I have access, and I have a big, fancy house. My big fancy house where I paid an artisan from Europe to come by the hour and restore the plaster in my house by hand, where I took a slate roof off and put a new slate roof on. The total cost per square foot to do that restoration in a local historic district was $105 a square foot. $105 a square foot to restore what was a rooming house into a single family home using the highest end things you can put on a house. Um, and also just not being a developer, not necessarily knowing what I'm doing. Um, so when people talk to you about the exorbitant costs of restoring houses in local districts, there's nothing about the local district that makes it expensive. People's tastes, people's choices may make it more or less expensive, but the district doesn't do that. Um, I'm here in support of Golden Belt because I see what's happened in Cleveland Holloway. In the past year, we've had over 10 homes that were 1,000 square feet, two bedroom, one bath houses, have been demolished. 
Those 0.1 acre lots now have 2,000, 2,400, 3,000 square foot houses on them. So while the local district won't stop prices from going up in Golden Belt, they will constrain massive development from happening next door to small affordable houses. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ran Maron. I currently live at 605 Primitive Street and I'll soon be moving to 208 North Driver Street. I'm here to speak in support of the Golden Belt Historic District. Right next door to our current house, um, until recently, stood a house of about 1,100 square feet, which was damaged by a fire. It was entirely restorable. A couple of months ago, we woke up to bulldozers um, and s next door to beautiful old trees being t torn down. And what is happening now is a 2,600 square foot um, mansion is being built next door. Having an affordable, having a historic district would quite easily prevent this. Further, our new, our new house, which we are currently renovating on North Driver Street, is less than five minutes walk away from the Holton Community Center. It's about 15 minutes walk away from the Durham uh, Rescue Mission Community Center. I don't quite understand the need for this fervor community center when 15 minutes away the city has provided a inc truly incredible facility with free computers, free web access, a free gym, meals on a regular basis, a center that's being used by a community that needs this center, a center that's accessible not only to the old East Durham neighborhood but also to the Golden Belt neighborhood. And so I don't quite understand what community center I meant to support. If we already have one that is entirely accessible to the folks that many people here are trying to support, then why spend the money on a new one? Why not support a historic district which, which will keep housing affordable, which will enable the, the building of new, affo new affordable homes that preserve the historic character of the area? I look forward to, to moving to my new house and to being a part of this community. Thank you very much. Good evening. Um, my name is Talma Talon. I live at 605 Primitive Street and will soon be moving to 208 North Driver Street. I am here to support my neighbors, my community, that has asked for a local historic district in their neighborhood in Golden Belt. I am here to support their request for affordable housing, for maintaining of affordable housing by preserving the small affordable properties that are there. As an educator in Durham Public Schools, I see a lot of families that are being pushed out of their homes by raising rents, by raising home prices, and this is something that I would like to support my neighbors in my community preventing. Thank you very much. Pardon me, could you state your name again? Did you sign one of these cards? Tal Matalon. Did, did you sign one of the cards? I did. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Good evening. My name is Jordan Capps. I live at 1005 Morning Glory uh, in the Golden Belt District. So uh, my wife and I, I believe, uh, represent uh, part of the community, part of the fabric of the Golden Belt uh, neighborhood. And I say that because I actually returned from China where I was uh, interested in microfinance work and started dating a lovely young lady who was working with Habitat for Humanity, building houses up the street um, from where we would eventually buy our first home. Uh, fell through the floor, but only one leg, uh, um, and uh, renovated that home. Uh, planted all kinds of stuff in the backyard. If you've ever been by, maybe you see my wife out in the backyard with her bees. Um, we started a family there. We were married in the backyard. We subsequently moved around the corner to a house that was a burned out shell, quite honestly. Um, but what makes this neighborhood is not entirely just the structures. It's not entirely just the historic buildings that are there and that so many people have, uh, have worked so hard to repair. Um, it is the people. Uh, it is primarily a front porch community. The reason that we are there is that because my wife introduced me to the people that were there. Uh, Deidreana and Antoine came by and gave me a tour, showed me what was possible in a home, connected me to others who have lived in the neighborhood for decades. 
That is what makes this a community. In the form of interaction that we particularly enjoy and appreciate, what makes this so unique and special is that it is a front porch community. If anything were done to change the way that people interact on a daily basis, saying hello and goodbye at the start and end of their day because they no longer have those uh, facing front porches, that would devastate the community and irrepar irreparably change the fabric of, of our neighborhood. So on that ground, I ask that you support the neighborhood uh, with the historic district as proposed. Thank you. Hello. My name is Barbara Taylor, and I live at 1310 East Main Street, one block down from the mis Mission. I've been there for 33 years. <coughs> Pardon me. And during those 33 years, the, the Mission has, as of to date, gained um, ownership of all but three properties in my block. I am one of only <coughs> two homeowners left. I'm just, I'm upset that the boundary has not ex been extended to include more of the neighborhood. I'm afraid I'm going to wake up one morning and there's going to be a dormitory surrounding, in fact, we are all, we're surrounded by tumble down houses owned by the mission. We need <laughs> to look at how these neighborhood communities are going to be developed to um, serve the uplifting of all of the residents in, in the area. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Deidreana Freeman and I live at 1005 Worth Street. And I want to be clear in stating that this has nothing to do with the services that the Durham Rescue Mission provides and everything to do with them as a developer. And I think um, many of the thoughts that I have have been shared already through email and newspaper articles and that uh, type of thing. Uh, also through my neighbors that you've heard already. I want to make sure that I do say that we support our Golden Belt neighborhood as a local historic district and I'm here to explain why. As a neighbor, the Durham Rescue Mission for almost 10 years, <clears throat> under the leadership of Reverend Ernie Mills and Gail Mills, has operated in a way that's bothered me. And I, wanted, I want you to know that we have a much larger complex issue developing out of this separation and segregationist uh, approach that they've been taking and trying to separate the community. Uh, we, are, we have a fairly mixed, diverse community uh, by age, race, by ethnicity, people with disabilities, people without, with people, people with money, without money, monetary wealth, and uh, it really deeply concerns me about how the growing divide of equity is going to start to look as we start to move forward. However, one thing uh, we all have in common is our love and commitment to the place that we live in 365 days of the year. Uh, I want to make sure that I note that the one exception here has has often been in, in the community conversations around the things that we as people who live in the neighborhood is, is Ernie and Gail Mills. And it's made a very clear message for the people that live in my neighborhood that they're not in support of us. Uh, and because the rescue mission is, is considered a, a faith-based organization, I've prayed on this. It really concerns me. And I feel like maybe my pride might be taken over and I have to step back and say, this is, this is not about me. This is more about the people that live in my neighborhood. Good evening, evening everybody. City Council and everyone. I am here for this designation. And the reason that I am is because I'm sorry, the word says, sorry. my name is Regina. King, I'm sorry, Mayor. No problem. I live at 309 Wayne Circle, Durham, North Carolina. And I actually live here. It's nice to see all these people, quite a few of them that I know don't live here. So with that all being said, because I'm very animated, I'm going to say that, you know, the word says in the Quran and even the Torah, it addresses poverty and poor people. And it says that we will always have the poor doesn't mean that they got to stay poor. It means that at some point, 
we will have people who should go into home ownership to get out of poverty. So this designation not only helps them get out of poverty, but it may make them be able to get homes that eventually will provide them with some stability that will help them move to something different. I don't have a problem with the rescue mission. I'm a minister. I know about nonprofits. But I do have a problem with bullying. I have a problem when people want to bully a neighborhood. And with that being said, and I'm speaking to the people in the audience, my sisters and brothers, my other ministers, the other pastors, let's stop the bullying. Let's address things. Let's be able to formulate something that you know 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 what you're talking about before you make a decision, before you bring people here that are not going to do what's good for the entire community. I don't have a dog in that fight. I don't live there. I live over by Central. And I moved there because I knew that something was going to happen in that area to bring me out of poverty, which I am. So I want that same thing for the rest of our people, whether they're white or black. And let's not make this a racial issue. Amen? Good evening, Mr. Mayor and city council members. Ah, I look out here and I see this situation. Just, 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 just a minute. Oh. Didn't recognize you with that hat on and your glasses on. Well, you do it sometimes, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, let, let, let me see your jacket. I, I'm, I, I'm proponent and I'm up there. You got me in the old opponent, but I'm pro. No, I, I'm I didn't pro have your card because that's what I was looking for. Yeah, it's in the, I marked it wrong. Can I have my two minutes? Yeah, you got two minutes. All right, thank you. Um, I'm Jacqueline Wagstaff. And I don't have a problem with the mission as a whole, but I'm like Ms. Deidreana, I have a problem with this situation and this bullying. This reminds me of the no book store and the situation that went on between landlord and tenant. Ernie Mills does not live in that area. He is a tenant. He has a business in that area. His business is helping people through his Christian organization, but he does not live there. And we know, Steve, you live in a historically designated area on Club Boulevard. Would you want this over there beside you? Would you want him to build up around your house on Club Boulevard? I'm pretty sure not. But poor people in poor neighborhoods de tend to always be a part of this. And I'm looking at all these people in here and most of his clients over there. And my question is, how many home ownership homeowners have he created with his help of these people? How many of his people with all those property he's obtained in the area have actually become homeowners when they left his business? I just think that you need to give these people this designation because as we know, I think his organization is considered a Christian substance abuse rehabilitation program. Well, we know when you put those in an area with homeowners, the property value is not going to increase. We know that. So everybody that owns a home, what few people do own a home in Northeast Central Durham, if they're anywhere around the Mills campaign compound, they're not going to increase their value on their properties. And that is not fair to the homeowners. The same way with the Golden Belt. They've asked for this. They are the homeowners. This is the business. You should consider what those homeowners want. They want this, you need to give it to them, and you need not to be bullied by 2,100 signatures that probably were attained on the book bag drive. So you better know. Good evening, Mayor Bell, members of the council. My name's Eddie Belk. I have been in Durham and a Durham resident for about three decades now and have dedicated my professional life to the preservation and adaptive reuse of our architectural heritage here. Um, in the very start of the 20th, uh, I live at 5208 Stevens Lane in Durham. At the very start of the 20th century, the Golden Belt Mill began. Over the next half a century and more, it expanded and prospered through two world wars 
And while its companion mill on the other side of Main Street, Durham Hosier Mill was doing the same and expanding. As each mill grew, the village grew. And the people that, that mill was the hub of their life and the center of their life grew. They stuck together through hard times of the world wars, hard times of economic stress, and they knew that they had a village there and they had a neighborhood there. The mill, and for some reason I'm on four seconds perpetually, <laughs> the, the mill had supported their lives and had given them community and given them a good way to have friends and life and a village that they could call their own. As it floundered, the mill started to weaken and the village started to weaken. As time went by and folks started to respect the value in the old areas, the mills were renovated again and became the hub of the community again and the village started to strengthen. We all have a great deal of respect for the Durham Rescue Mission and for everything they try to do. We all, I also have a great deal of respect for the value so, of architecture in preserving the environment of one's lives. All right, thank you, Eddie. Good evening. My name is Ideal Ortiz Hill, and I reside at 1808 Vale Street, a few blocks from the rescue mission. And I just want to start off by saying to everyone that's out in the lobby and here, I moved willingly to my neighborhood knowing that the Durham Rescue Mission was there. I have always had an open heart to everyone in my community, no matter where they are on the journey. This is not at all an indictment of who should or should not be in the community. This is simply a desire for there to be more dialogue, more connectivity, more understanding between the leadership, the executive staff, of the Durham Rescue Mission and the residents who have also made long-term investments with their blood, sweat, and tears. And so I just want to say that as a result, you know, Ernie, I've seen you at many neighborhood charrettes along with your son, and I tremble standing this close to you because of how negatively you have spoken about our neighbors in calling us the dangerous and unsafe people that you don't want your residents exposed to. And so what we're asking from our city council is to provide a process that would become part of this historic district that would allow us a mechanism for any developer, not just the Durham Rescue Mission, who wants to develop in our community, for there to be dialogue so that the plans are compatible, so that the plans take into account the needs of more than one entity so that there is balance. And so that's all we're asking for is balance, not annihilation of anybody in this room. Just balance. And so, you know, Miss Barbara, um, who was here earlier, no, excuse me, Miss Rhonda, speaking of 1305 and 1309 East Main Street, you know, she can't have anyone move in and be her neighbor because those homes are not in that condition. And my mother always told me that you know what you can count on in the future based on how people have acted in the past. They have not been good stewards of the resources that they have by allowing this historic property to be dilapidated. And so I am for the historic district. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, members of council. My name is Tom Miller. I serve you as a member of the Durham Planning Commission. You have my comments concerning this case in your packet. Uh, and so I'm not gonna go over all of that. But I do want to point out one thing that I think is very important. And I want to talk about the interest that ordinary people have in their homes and where they live. Life happens in our homes and our neighborhoods. Uh, it is the fundamental thing that everybody who lives in Durham has. Uh, it cuts across the board. It's an interest to me that is paramount. And in this case, you should vote for this request for a local historic district because it has been asked for by the ordinary people of East Durham to protect their homes and their neighborhood where their lives happen, where their fundamental interest in the city lies. Because they have asked for it, you should grant it. And why, what makes it so special? Well, we have a complicated zoning code and complicated zoning processes. The UDO and all of its attachments are 750 pages long. 
uh, the processes that we have to change, to change zoning or anything, the application fees are prohibitive. Uh, the expertise that's needed to put plans together, you need architects, you need land planners, you need attorneys, all of that. These are things that are beyond the reach of the ordinary people who are interested in protecting their homes. We have very few procedures reposed in that code that are available to ordinary people where they are the initiators. They're not just the responders. You hear zoning cases every month. They come and they go. And who the people who started are the people who have. They're the resources. Tonight, an exceptional case where the ordinary people are the moving parties. They have accessed the code, the one of the few procedures available to them, and they have asked for it. And they are in East Durham. This is an area of town that we have talked about for years, disinvestment and neglect. If we're going to raise East Durham, who's going to do it better? Thank you, the Tom. people of East Durham. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, that concludes all the persons that are uh, signed up. To call. I'd ask people who want to speak to come forth. I don't see anybody else standing in the line, so I assume that those persons are not, not present. Uh, we, we're going to move now to the opponents of this proposed district. And just as we did with the proponents, as you come to the mic, I would ask that you state your name, address, and to make sure, speaking to this point, that you are an opponent of this proposed district. Uh, Charles Gibbs, is Charles Gibbs present? Is Charles Gibbs present? Sylvester Williams, is Sylvester Williams present? Uh, Clay Walters, Clay Walters present? Uh, Marcus Howard, is Marcus Howard present? Jared Eatons, Vivian McCoy, Sylvia, is it Robinson, Ribison? Will Roberts, is Will Roberts present? Gwen Silver. Barbara Taylor, is Barbara Taylor present? Steve Hopkins, Steve Hopkins present? Cheryl Smith. Alice Cheek, Reverend Aaron Gamble, Ernie Mills Jr., Gail Mills, Rob, is this Michael going, going out? Rob Tart, Ernie Mills Sr. Now, is there anyone's name that I didn't call that had signed up to speak, that wanted to speak on this item as an opponent? If not, we'll hear from the opponents. And again, if you just state your name and address and uh, reaffirm that you are an opponent of this proposal. I'm sorry. Sure. Thank you. Um, most folks have been doing this as they come up to speak, but if you all would be willing to also state along with your address whether you live in or near the proposed district, that would be helpful for context. Thank you. Well, let, let, let's say this, Jillian. When you say near, what does near mean? <laughs> A couple folks were saying that they live, you know, two blocks from the rescue mission or around the corner. Just if you, if you would like to let us know that you live in the district, that would be helpful. Uh, are you in line, sir? Are you Mr. Gibbs? You come forward, please. Good evening, members of the council. Uh, my name is Charles Gibbs. I live at 802 Royal Oaks Drive in Durham County, and I'm glad for that last uh, request for information. I live in the county, but I grew up as an urban kid born in Edgemont. And I want to speak to another aspect of the proposed boundary of a Golden Belt Historic District, an issue before us tonight that I think transcends other issues that have been in discussion for years in that it involves historical accuracy and legitimacy of this uh, 
defining of a boundary for a Golden Belt and Historical District. I want to bring to light information regarding the historic boundaries of the, lar the larger Edgemont, a real community and neighborhood area that should not be forgotten nor arbitrarily picked apart to enlarge an assumptive mill, mill village history. Even if a lot of the structures in relevant to Edgemont and Greater Durham, including the two commercial districts there, have over the decades gradually been lost to demolition by normal decay, condemnation, official directive to make room for new structures or whatever the city wants to do with that and general apathy and ignorance of Edgemont's historical value to Durham. Um, and, and one interesting item, uh, Free Edgemont Free Will Baptist Church, where I grew up, uh, we all know the Claiborne Ellis and Atwater saga, best of enemies. Well, Claiborne was a member of Edgemont Free Will Baptist Church, and I was fortunate enough as an early teen to witness this play out, and I'm grateful for that uh, and this church needs to be preserved and this is a note to preservation Durham the list could go on what's left is in no respect indicative of what Edgemont once was housing and all but its boundaries still exist and and in some entities uh, like the Durham Rescue Mission extraordinary efforts uh, and Th East thank Durham you, thank cannot, you, thank you, Mr. Gibbs. this cannot be part of East Durham because East Durham and Edgemont were two separate communities. Thank you. Thank you. I am Pastor Sylvester Williams. I live on 404 Sparrow Street in East Durham. Uh, I'm a writer and candidate for Durham County Commissioner. We just concluded a month long crusade in Durham where I had 30 churches to come together, teaching the teachings, giving the teachings of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus, and provided food, clothing, and shelter to those that were in need. In other times, we have conducted late night tent services and have had people to show up that were homeless. Each time that I took them to the Durham Rescue Mission, they received them no matter the time of night. I also know of families that have benefited from the drug programs that help them find jobs. Durham Rescue Mission provides the type of services that Durham needs for those that have been overlooked. Not only should the Durham Rescue Mission be allowed to expand in the targeted location, the city of Durham needs more programs and services that will provide resources for the homeless and the drug addicted. The following excerpt was produced by the Duke Center for Child and Family Policy, Substance Abuse and Abuse in Durham County. About 18,000 Durham adults about 18,000 drum adults abused drugs or alcohol in 2012, and among them were a growing number of prescription drug abusers. Prescri prescription drug abuse is on the rise statewide. Across the state, 1,140 residents died from unintentional poisonings in 2011, and nearly 80% of those deaths were related to prescription drug abuse. That's a 300% increase since 1991. Durham mirrored the statewide trend with 16 deaths related to, to prescription drugs in 2011. Using a wealth of data from several different agencies, the report summarizes the toll substance abuse takes on the community. This report further emphasizes the current and future need for a facility like the Durham Rescue Mission. If you're not going to build it here, where are you going to build it? There is a tremendous need in the city of Durham for people who's willing to do what the Durham Rescue Mission is doing. And if you're not going to do it here, where? Thank you. Good evening. My name is Clay Waters. I live at 1893 Terry Road, and I'm the senior pastor at Greystone Church in Durham. Many of us in the faith community see the Durham Rescue Mission as one of our greatest resources. Though a lot of our churches have benevolent related ministries, none of us operates a homeless shelter. When people come to our churches looking for shelter, at Greystone we often refer them to the Durham Rescue Mission. We've come to trust in their overwhelming love for people. They believe that each person has intrinsic worth before God, and regardless of personal struggles, each person is deserving of respect and dignity. 
The Durham Rescue Mission gives hope to hurting people. Nothing is more valuable than the worth of an individual. No historic district is more valuable than a human being finding hope. Preservation isn't nearly as important as restoration. When broken lives are restored, everybody wins. Our neighborhoods win, our communities win, and our city wins. I'm here tonight to respectfully ask the council to exclude the rescue missions property on the east side from the historic district. This would allow the rescue mission to move forward in their proposed expansion. It would allow them to advance the cause of changing lives one life at a time. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Marcus Howard. I live at 2628 Kirk Road in Durham. I've listened to, I've been a long time resident of Durham, uh, over 35 years I came here and married my wife who has lived in Durham all her life. I had the opportunity to serve the um, area of Durham in question down around Morning Glory, Few Gardens uh, for many years when I first came here with the um, service that I did in the homes. I saw the decline of the neighborhood over the years and uh, this is reported in many places. I'm not here to really oppose the the Golden Belt District. I think it's a great idea. What I do want you to consider is trying to work with the Durham Rescue Mission. I've been a longtime supporter of them. I have uh, provided occasional volunteer services, financial assistance, and I've also taken a resident and made him a neighbor of mine. I have a lot of experience with um, the way that they operate. I've seen the need for growth that they've had over the years. Durham Rescue Mission has come from the need of the city. It has grown for that reason. The reason that they have uh, empty lots is because they work on a cash basis. They only grow as they can. A few years ago, the city approved them creating a new building. And, and now the dilemma is that they have, um, they're trying to provide need, uh, to provide for the needs of the community. Thank you very much. Good evening. Um, Jared Edens, I live at 1708 Moorhead Hill Court in Durham. I've been the engineer for the Rescue Mission since about 2009 on their current expansion plans at the men's campus. Um, somehow we managed to, to build a nice facility and add a new nice building without the benefit of a local historic district. So it is possible to have quality redevelopment without having extra um, requirements from a historic district. Uh, I routinely come here, I represent developers all the time who want to rezone their property, make changes to their property. The difference there is those developers own the property or have an option on the property and they're asking only to affect the property they own. They're not coming here asking you to change zoning or change parcels of property that other people own. Uh, someone earlier mentioned the term bullying was thrown around a couple times. Well, bullying is telling someone what to do, what to do with their property. That's bullying. Uh, we're not asking here for, for any other properties in the district to be affected, only the property that's owned by the rescue mission. Um, so that's definitely not bullying. I'm also not here to talk about a community center. I'm not here to talk about any specific use. Um, I know there's been plenty, there, we've talked about a community center, we've done some sketches in my office, but that's as far as it's gone. My point is any use, uh, single family, townhomes, condos, dormitories, whatever, any use with this district in place is going to have to undergo another la layer of bureaucracy. It's inevitably going to add cost to the project. It's a fact. There's no way around it. Now, some people say, well, it's just a little cost. You can afford it. It's just money. You know, anything's possible, right? It's just money. Well, every dollar that's spent on this process 
after the historic district is one less dollar for food. It's one less dollar for kids' backpacks, Thanksgiving turkeys, Christmas presents. Every dollar counts. That's how they can turn one dollar into four with their donations. Every dollar counts. So I would ask you, remember the partnership you've had with the mission for the last 30 or 40 years. Think of the amount of money that's been saved by the, for the city on behalf of the rescue mission and consider that when you make your decision tonight, please. Thank you. Before you begin, let, let me ask those in the audience to refrain from clapping. We, we, we just want to hear this. We know you, you're for, some people are against, but let the speakers say what they want to say and the next speaker come forth, if you don't mind. Thank you. Okay. Bibby McCoy, 2701 Owen Street. It's amazing. Every time the rescue mission planned to do something additional to their properties, the residents in Golden Belt always challenging them. Golden Belt residents are already isolated themselves. You can't even see their houses from Austin Avenue. So the boundaries where the rescue mission is should not be inclusive of the historical district. When you go across the street, the history, if you want to know the history for across the street and you are not original Dermite and not born in this city, black folks was packed and few garden. Black folks was paying rent in substandard housing to super landlords that care nothing about their properties. So that's the history from across the street. The people who reside in Golden Belt, if you want a historical district, take it on up to Dillard Street. Take it to Dillard. Then you can include Edge Mount Community, East Main Street, and Odom Towers. But they always, the residents who are not original, quote, unquote, from Durham, North Carolina, are always trying to project their ideas in a community that was established way before they ever got here. So the history is exclude Durham Rescue Mission from the historical district because they're already isolated. You can't see any of their houses from Austin Avenue. You can't see their houses from East, from East, uh, East Main Street. So I hope that you will not vote to support what these people want to do in the Golden Belt area. And I have a letter here from the pastor. Honorable, honorable members of the city council, my neighbors, my name is Melvin Whitley. I live 2614 Harvard Avenue in East Durham. 20 years ago, I was homeless. I, I ate out of garbage cans behind restaurants. Weeks went by and I could not bathe. I went into service stations to to wash up on, in their bathrooms. And the one thing I remember was that I was invisible to other people. People passed me by and they couldn't see me. This whole debate has turned ugly because we don't want to see people. The Durham Rescue Mission is not against Golden Belt Historical District. What they're against is raising the cost of surviving on the east side of their property. A property that they meet the needs of the needy. 
the least of these. The least of these have not spoken. So all those that are against development, I mean the Golden Belt Historical District on the east side, please stand. Thank you. You're welcome. Good evening, council members. My name is Will Roberts. I live at 2619 Fremont Road. I grew up on Gear Street and I'm a third generation Durhamite. I've been involved with the Durham Rescue Mission in some capacity for over 20 years. And I've seen the good that they have done in this community they were investing in this city when no one else was. They were building and repairing this city when no one else was. They were helping the poorest of our city when no one else was. Now when investment and financial growth and financial gain is the easy thing to do, they're gonna be marginalized. They're gonna be restricted and hindered in the continued plans for helping our fellow citizens. I would say the reason that our growth is taking place in this city today is because of the great work that the Durham Rescue Mission has done. Proverbs 22, 23 says, Rob not the poor, being tempted by their helplessness. Neither oppress the afflicted at the gate where the city court is held. For the Lord will plead their cause and deprive of life those who deprive the poor or afflicted. So I ask you not to vote for anything that hinders the mission in providing affordable housing or that restricts their property in any way that does not already exist. I urge you to stand with them and for them because they have always stood with Durham. Thank you. Good evening, members of the City Council. Gwen Silver, 302 Sapphire Drive here in Durham. Uh, 1974, 42 years ago, the Mills family came to Durham with their vision, their hopes, and their dreams to provide for the poor in Durham County. I looked at the number of people in the line, and in 1974, I don't even think some of them were born. Their dreams are coming after the dreams of the Durham's Rescue Mission. I want to thank you because in the past you've sub supported the LGBT community, identification for undocumented uh, persons, the Islamic community, and you move forward to um, be against the HB2, and you put together a forum for the police and the community to come together. I ask you to support the Durham Rescue Mission and their plans to build on the east side of Austin Avenue. I watched the Durham beautiful southern landscape skyline become like New York skyscrapers. I didn't particularly like it, but I did accept it. I stand with them in their vision, and I stand with them for equal access and equal opportunities, which was mentioned before about the Hispanic community. They have a vision, they have a dream. We've got back lanes for bikers, and the person mentioned about living over near NCCU. What they're going to build is not gonna be any different. I ask you again to stay with the Durham Rescue Mission, with their dreams and their visions that came long before the people who now live in Golden Belt. Thank you so very much. Good evening. My name is Cheryl Smith. Um, I live at 302 North Holman Street. I'm right there at the corner of Holman and Franklin Street where they want to make it historical. I'm here on behalf of Franklin Village Resident Council and the community and our management to support the meals. Um, our community, we were where a few gardens used to be. Now we were Franklin Village. And in the past, when, my, when I first moved to Franklin Village, it was almost like few gardens again. Uh, Mr. Mills, the Pat, team, Pat One, and District One the Police Department, and our city manager came and helped us get our community under control. For the last four years, we have been gang free, we have been crime free, and our community is awesome. When we turn, when, anytime we need something, when we turn to Mr. Mills, they never say no. 
when we have residents that move in our community that need clothing, furniture, or anything for their homes, we call the meals. They give us a voucher to help these families. Now, I tried to move on um, Driver Street, uh, uh, I think last year or year before last. I couldn't find anywhere on Driver Street that I could afford. Unfortunately, I can't afford to be a homeowner, but I can be a renter. And maybe I don't want to be a homeowner. Maybe I don't want that responsibility. But we can't even move on driver. My grandkids is in Marine Joy. I wanted to move across the street or close to Marine Joy so we could, I could walk my grandkids to school. We can't even afford it. Everything is for sale. Nothing is for rent. There's nothing over there affordable. And the reason these people are allowed to uh, have these homes because a lot of people has become homeless so they can be, they have their, they fancy the homes and sit on their nice porches. What about those people that used to live on that street that's no longer have a home to live in? No one is thinking about that. When you walk, go to the parks and see these mothers walking their children at night, they are homeless. These people have been pushed out of East Durham. No one is addressing this issue. Go to the parks, go to Hillside Park, go to any park, you see a single mother with four, three, four, and five children. Thank you. Nowhere to go. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alice Chick. I'm uh, the head of Edgemont Am's uh, home development. So I do own a home. As I begin to own a home, I come out of Fruit Garden and bought me a home. Um, Ernie Mill and them, they support our district in Edgemont. They does a lot for our kids in Edgemont. On National Night Out, they donate so much stuff over there for our national night out. I had a young lady with a baby just about two months ago, and she didn't have nowhere to go. She told me she went to the mid, to the um, shelter, and she went here, and she went there, and she said, Miss Cheek, where can I go? And I called Gail, and Gail said, send her to the women's shelter that we own, and she, she, she went there. So I look at them being a blessing to people, regardless of what they got and how they got it. It's a blessing. And what they building in the neighborhood is helping people. Ain't nobody else going to help them. People have been walking homeless for years in Durham, Durham my home. And I done seen some homeless people walking in Durham. I remember when Mr. Ernie and them started the development, in Durham, I stayed in Fruit Garden. I remember the day they took over the church. And it has really grown in the neighborhood. So I stand 100% on their development of what they want to do in the neighborhood because it's going to help the people, not just one color, but all colors. I do a lot of volunteers there, and I don't see just one color. I see all colors. So please stand behind whatever, what they want done in their, in their town. That's theirs. It don't belong to us. They got that on their own. That's theirs. So I vote for them to have what they want for the community, and they're willing to share it. Mr. Mayor, City Council members, my name is Steve Hopkins. I live at 609 East Main Street. Uh, a block and a half from Golden Belt. All right, um, I am here in opposition of the proposed historic district, not only because of the attempt to raise the property value of the neighborhood in the district, but also because of what it will do to the cost of renovations for the low-income homeowners that will not be able to afford uh, to fix them up uh, in that district. We all know that prices for repairs are already high. And with this becoming a historic district, the price will double. So for the low-income homeowners in that neighborhood, where's the money going to come from? You know, uh, I know people are telling the homeowners that there will be help for them. But me and you know there won't be. You know, Not with it being so close to downtown. You know, um, because the area is already targeted for upscale development. It is happening all around them. This is an attempt on the Durham Rescue Mission, plain and simple. 
as a supporter of the Durham Rescue Mission, the men and women that it helps, I say no to the properties that they own. I say, Mr. Mayor, I remember how well in the past, the past owners kept those properties, and I know you remember that. And how hard it was us, it, was, it took us to get those properties out of their hands. And thanks to the Durham Rescue Mission, we was able to do that, you know. Um, ask these questions. Why not include Hopkins Street up to Liberty Street? Why go across Austin Avenue? You're only going for what, four houses? Why? Why you want 15 vacant lots? Thank you. Mr. Mayor, honorable members of the council, uh, my name is Aaron Gamble, I pastor Lighthouse Baptist Church, and I'm a biblical counsel at the Durham Rescue Mission. My present residence is at 313 Love Lolly Drive, Durham, North Carolina. One man assesses his value based on his property. Another man assesses his property value based on himself. On his surface, aesthetically, it seems that because of hostilities and anger, because of insensitivity of emotions, that we have a conflict, a confrontation. When in actuality, from the standpoint that I view, it's not really a confrontation, it's a cohabitation. Can these two exist together? And in the, in the wisdom of Solomon, I mean, you, to me, have the simplest decision to make. And that decision is that you can grant both of these entities their desires. The Durham Rescue Mission has no qualms with the Homeowners Association. It has no qualms with the uh, historic preservation. The real issue is that there are two visions. There's a vision of the value of property and there's a vision of the value of people. But it should not be a conflict. It should be a cooperation. And in such a way, if we would take note of just this simple principle, the rescue mission is asking for certain properties to be excluded from inclusion into the, uh, the proposal. And the historic district is asking for properties to be granted. It is a simple solution. Give the historic preservation the, what they want and give the ministry the privilege that it has. That together we may cooperate and facilitate the continued development of individuals within our confines of the community. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council Members. My name is Rob Tart. I live at 406 Far Left Lane in Bahama. I'm also the Chief Operating Officer of the Durham Rescue Mission. It's interesting to me as I listen to these comments that have been made tonight that people are impugning the motives of Ernie Mills. I've served with Ernie Mills for 21 years. I try to count myself to be a faithful employee. I don't question his motives. I don't question his intent. He wants to help the children in our area. Our area needs a community center. I think that if we have this historic designation, it'll probably never happen. You can almost feel the vitriol in the room sometimes. We feel it won't happen because it won't happen. But we need a place for organized sports for the youth. We need a place for tutoring and after school programs. We need a place for boys and Girl Scouts and other such programs. We need a place for the homeless in the area to go and not be on the street, to play ball. Sometimes the homeless do feel isolated. That's not something we choose for them. As has been mentioned, they're invisible. The Durham Rescue Mission just wants to help. We don't ask for the city to provide. We don't ask for the county. We don't ask for anything. 
We ask for the people in this community to provide, and they have for 42 years. I'm sure there are many needs that this facility could meet in the future that I can't forecast right now. But clearly there is a need, I think, for this building. And I implore you, we're not asking to do anything to the community, to the, to the historic people. Let them have what they want to have. But let the homeless have what they need. My name is Ernie Mills, Jr. I'm the stewardship officer at the Durham Rescue Mission. I live at 5614 Green Bay Drive here in Durham. Our neighborhood on the east side of 55 was originally built to house the working poor who worked in the Golden Belt Mill. And as this historic district effort began to move forward, we began to research how that would affect the working poor who have lived there since its inception. As the results came in, it became clear the district would be detrimental to our efforts to offer clean, safe, affordable housing to those in our city who need it most. We reached out to a contractor who specializes in restoring historic properties. He told us it would cost $80 per square foot to build a nice home on the land we have now. He further went on to say if annexed into the historic district, it would cost $150 per square foot to renovate a home that we have there to uh, bring it up to standards. This is simply not affordable. If this were true, one would reasonably expect to see home sales and rent figures that are increasing. As a matter of fact, 1004 Worth Street sold for $8,900 in 2009. It sold again in May of this year for $295,000. 1005 Morning Glory sold for $10,500 in 2003. It sold again this year for $330,000. That is a fantastic return for speculators and investors. But at what cost to the poor? They can't afford to stay there. They're getting pushed out yet again. I believe Durham can have it all. And on behalf of the thousands of donors and volunteers and the hundreds of people here tonight, the lobby's packed. I ask you to favorably consider the Durham Rescue Mission's request to be excluded from the historic district. My name is Gail Mills. I live at 914 Spruce Pine Trail in Durham. My husband and I started the Durham Rescue Mission 42 years ago. Tonight you were given a packet uh, from the Durham Rescue Mission. If you would look in that packet, there's a petition in there, and I would like to go over that with you. Uh, if you will look through it, uh, there are 160 properties listed on this petition. This was the citizen's petition that was uh, given to you where the property owners in Golden Belt were requesting you to create a local historic district. 160 properties listed on this. 36 people signed the petition. On the east side of Highway 55, where we are asking for our property to be excluded, eight people signed that they wanted to be included in the historic district. We heard about bullying tonight. I think that's bullying. When 36 people want 160 properties to be included in a local historic district. So I do not feel that it is unreasonable for the Durham Rescue Mission to ask you to exclude us from uh, the local historic district if you vote on that tonight. Um, there's been a lot of things said about the mission. Uh, the rescue mission in the past three years has invested $5 million in Northeast Central Durham. And Lord willing, in the next three years, we will be investing another $6 million in that community. 
the, we've been in that community 42 years. You hear how the prices of housing are going up. The Durham Rescue Mission is not detrimental to the property values in that community. Uh, when we move, thank you. Mayor Bell, City Council. Oh, uh, Ernie Mills, uh, founder of the Durham Rescue Mission. Uh, I done forgot my address. 914 Spruce Pine Trail. You scare me to death. <laughs> and not only on top of that, I brought something to read and my lens came out. So I can't even halfway read tonight. But we come to you tonight and this rests in your hands what to do, the fate. Part, part of the faith of the Durham Rescue Mission. Does it really have to be all or nothing? None of us, none of us that's presented tonight, none of us has said, do not do the Golden Belt community. We support the Golden Belt community, and we want everybody to know that. We're not opposed to that. We were accused of opposing to it, but we're not. We just want our property just on the east side of Highway 55 to be excluded, which consists of 15, primarily 15 vacant lots and, and four other properties that they said that might be contributing to the historic society. So I think you, you've seen with the skyrocketing prices that's already taken place, no decision that you make tonight will stop the skyrocketing prices of property there. I know that, you know that, I know that. But what we're asking for now is just a small area within that district that we can help the poor. And, I, and I'm here to say that really those that are opposing the district, I mean that supporting the district, they're the ones that are the most well off, they are successful, they have bought their houses. And I'm here to tell them that we need them they are successful. We're working with those that, that have made some bad decisions. They have nothing. They can be role models to, to the ones that we work with. And, and what we're proposing today can create really a vibrant, mixed income neighborhood that can work together there. And, and that's our goal, is to create a vibrant, mixed income neighborhood. But if the resolution is passed, it's going to push out all of the, the, the uh, poor renters in the area. So please, just exclude the 20 properties east of Highway 55. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. L let me ask, is it anyone else that is in opposition to the proposed Golden Belt Locust Start District that would like to speak that has not had an opportunity to speak? You can come forward and give your name and address and I'm trying to be fair about this. Uh, there were more people speaking as proponents than opponents, but I'm still allowing two minutes each, so. Um, my name is Kevin Mickle, and I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. You have an address? My address is 1731 Sorrel Brook Way. But right. well, I was born in Durham and lived here in Durham until I went to college at East Carolina, where I studied accounting. And I got my master's in accounting and a master's in tax. And it's clear that what's going on is people are concerned more about preserving houses than they are lives. And that's the decision that you're making. And every choice that we all make counts. And you choose your own destiny. This city is choosing its own destiny. And the mission represents a flower, a huge flower in Durham. And everything that it touches, it grows out. It's a garden that grows out. Now, are you more interested in historic homes that 100 years from now nobody will even care about? Or do you care about people? You know, you do the right thing by agreeing with the mission and giving them 
what they need to continue to be your partner and not increase substantially the cost to help Durham. Okay, thank you for your time. Uh, I'm gonna assume that no one else wants to speak. Does anyone else, anyone else want to speak again in opposition to this item? Yes, sir. Is any, anyone else? This is the last person. Mr. Mayor and the Council, thank you very much. My name is Bill Wingard. I'm from way down on the coast of Nuba, North Carolina. We support the Durham Rescue Mission, but I just want to give could, you... Could, could you give us your home address, please? I'm sorry. I'm your home hear. address? 4705 Edgewood Drive, Trent Woods, North Carolina. Right. Okay. Our ministry is located in the Ghent District of Newburn. As you know, Newburn is quite a historical city. Uh, we faced the same thing down there. They had a historical overlap. We simply petitioned them like they have petitioned you. Please draw us out of that. They did. We've had excellent cooperation, and we've had no trouble with it. Thank you. Okay, for the record, that concludes all the speakers on this item. This is a public hearing matter. Uh, I'm going to close the public hearing. The matter's back before the council, and I'm going to take the prerogative to uh, just share some comments, and my other colleagues will have an opportunity to speak also. I, I, I've heard some comments about affordable housing, uh, and I, I want to make it clear that this council has gone on record as having a goal of achieving affordable housing in this community. We, we have that as one of our goals. Uh, you should also know that when we heard this presentation at the work session, one of the goals that was stated in the historic preservation proposal was affordable housing. And so we asked, do you really think you're gonna be develop, developing a historic district that's gonna have affordable housing? And the bottom line is, no, so they took it out. So that's not a goal of the historic, the Golden Belt Historic District, affordable housing. That's not a goal. So I don't want anybody to be under the impression that we're going to be establishing a district where there's an opportunity of affordable housing. Let, let me say this, for people who are living there, it's obviously affordable. I don't care what price range of the house is, it's affordable, so I'm not denying that. But to think that we're going to be creating a development that's going to be a mecca for affordable housing is just not the case. I'm not saying anything's wrong with that, but I just want to make sure that people understand that. The other piece about this is I, 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 I look at what has been accomplished by the mission in this community since I've been here. I've seen them when they first got started. I see what they continue to do. If you ever want to know about the level of poverty in this community, all you need to do is go to the mission on Easter holidays, Thanksgiving holidays, Christmas holidays, back to school holidays, and you see the number of persons in this community, but for not the commission, the work of the mission, they would, they would be going without. So it's no question about, in my mind, that they're a valuable asset to this community. But I also want to you know, applaud those persons who have supported the Golden Belt Local Historic District, the ones that have worked on it, the staff, I think you've done a great job. I think you've done a great job. My concern is that I think that you have overreached when, in my opinion, you're trying to pull property owners in that don't want to be there. And that's what's happening with this particular situation. You talk about a community being divided. The community is divided. It's divided now by Highway 55 is going to be further divided physically when it expands. When you talk about a community, you just had Franklin Village personnel come up and say they support it. They're very close to the mission, probably closer than some that are in the proposed Golden Belt piece. So I will be voting not for the proposed district. I will be voting to exclude the portion of the district that represents the Golden Belt. But that's, that's my vote. That's my vote. <laughs> that's my vote. Uh, you got six other votes on here, and I'm sure they have their opinion, and they will express them. But I just want to say from the outset, you know, I, I, I truly believe that there is a win-win situation. I think the win-win situation, in my opinion, would be to exclude the rescue mission from the proposed historic district 
and allow the historic district to do what it does best and allow the mission to do what it does best. There's an opportunity to build affordable housing on the mission's property if they don't have the further constraints that you might have for a historic district. If you've got them in there, that's different. I'm, I'm not even talking about the community center. We'll deal with that when it comes to be dealt with. But I'm dealing with what's being bef proposed before us now, and that's a proposal that includes a segment of our community that does not want to be included, who owns their property, who is not asked to be a part of it, who's not said they're against what is being proposed. And I think that's a reasonable course of action to take for me as the mayor of the city and for the vote that I have to take. So having said that, I'm going to defer to my colleagues for comments that any of them might have. Uh, recognize Councilman Moffitt. I'm going to make a few comments. Um, first of all, good evening. I love local governments where the real issues are decided, the issues that are most important to the people that live here. It's not often that people make the drive to Raleigh to talk to legislators, even though it has a lot of impact on us, and even less frequent that people go to Washington. But you can see by the room tonight, by the lobby outside, that this is the place where people can truly participate. And thank you all for being here. Thank you, everybody, on both sides of this issue. Um, that have been here because this is so important to you. Um, the issues, everybody knows, the proposed local historic district, it's not a city initiative that's been imposed on the community to preserve history. It is an effort by the community, which organized, gathered the signatures, and approached the city about creating the district four years ago. Two years ago, we finally funded a consultant to hold community meetings, research the area, and make a recommendation, and here we are. Um, I also want to thank the staff and the consultants while not everybody agrees with the resulting recommendation, the people who have worked on this for the city have been inclusive and professional in their work. Um, the recommendation that's in front of us tonight is a land use decision. And um, I'm going to jump for a moment. Um, I've lost the thread. I did want to ask the consultants to talk briefly about the, because here's the thing is that no one tonight, I don't think I've heard anybody take issue with the concept of a historic district, and I haven't heard anyone take any issue with anything on the west side of Austin Avenue. So it, those, to me, seem to be settled issues. Um, I'm, my colleagues may disagree, but they seem to be relatively settled. Um, what we are, um, uh, I think, a lot of contention about are the boundaries on the eastern side. And so um, I wanted to just go back to the consultants for a moment or for a minute and ask for uh, some of the thinking that went into the recommendation that you provided. Hi, uh, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Cynthia De Miranda. I'm with MDM Historical Consultants. And thank you for your question. Um, what we did when we began to look at the area and evaluate the boundary was um, it, with the petition came a sort of recommended starting boundary, which was the existing National Register boundary. Um, we looked at that, but we also looked at historic maps and development patterns and um, looked at the full extent of what the Golden Belt Company built as its factory and as its mill village. And ultimately, um, we chose a boundary that was slightly different from what was listed in the National Register because when you're coming up with local district boundaries, they are slightly, the reasonings for them are slightly different from the National Register. National Register is primarily an honor, and it's recognizing what is there and what remains. But the local historic district boundary, um, you, we looked at what was still there and, and what it had been originally. And you look for strong edges and strong corners and when we were out there in the field walking around looking at the buildings, it was very, very evident when you were in Golden Belt and when you were out of Golden Belt without looking back to the historic maps. What the, um, what the Golden Belt owners did was they built four or five different house styles and they repeated them. And it created a very distinctive um, rhythm of the streetscapes. And that was still very evident all the way over to Holman Street on every block. When you stood at Holman Street looking back up any of those streets, Morning Glory, Franklin, Worth, Taylor, Wall Street, 
you looked across Alston Avenue and you saw the factory and that landscape is intact and the streetscape is intact throughout the whole length of it. So we felt strongly that the integrity was still there, even though there are vacant pro properties. The integrity overall was still there and a local district is one resource. So we don't, um, I mean certainly you look at all the individual properties in it, but the counting up of this is a historic house and this is not a historic house, that's not really the way we look at a local historic district. We look, we look at the whole entity as a single historic resource. And the edges of it still remained very clear and very evident when we were out there in the field and walking around and the feeling of the landscape, the, the, the rhythm of the street faces, all of those things contributed to um, our ultimate decision to draw the boundary that we did. Ask Councilman Davis and the Mayor Pro Tem in that order. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I've, this has been a, 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 an informative set of discussions, and the word that keeps coming back to me is the word freedom. Um, and I, I applaud the people who want to have the freedom, uh, the original petitioners and, and others, who want to have a district that would maintain the integrity of the uh, historical nature of the district. And I think it's important to me, someone who looks at history very, very importantly, for people to be able to have the freedom to do that, to be able to say, let's try to maintain maybe the last vestiges that we have of the meal aspect, the meal characteristics of Durham. But also, I think the word freedom means a whole lot to me when it comes to people who want to have the freedom to do what they want to do with their individual properties. To be able to say that in spite of the fact that I'm close to this district, I want to have the freedom to do some things, particularly if it's a religious organization and we respect the idea that Religious organizations have the freedom to do things, to reach out, to try to work with people. Um, and, and so I, I see the freedom to deal with the and to advocate for the historical aspects. I see the freedom to try to work with people. And as several people have said, including the mayor, I think both of those things can coexist. So I would hope that we would look at the idea that um, we can solve both things. Somebody mentioned the whole idea of uh, the wisdom of Solomon. I think it sounds like in this case, we can put forth the wisdom of, of Solomon without cutting any baby in half. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, tonight is, good evening, everyone. It's just an example of uh, neighborhoods being divided and not working together. I have been in local government so long that I sort of read into a lot of comments that were made. And I see, I, I remember in my own neighborhood how we were pitted against uh, a gigantic university and we ended up uh, without having a neighborhood, period. Um, so. I guess I'm about building bridges and not putting up walls. I also agree with Eddie. Uh, freedom of uh, religion is, is important and being able to do what you can for humanity. And I often ask Eddie and um, Ernie and Gail, how on earth do you do what you do without asking the city for one penny when other organizations who do what you do are always asking us for money. How do you do it? Uh, I want you to pray. Okay. That's the problem. Um, I, I, I see um, something has unfolded here tonight for me that has to do with 
your Christianity. I bet, and that's just what I see. I have that power of discernment to see that a part of it is your approach. As a Christian, I have to look at this from my heart. And I know that I would not be able to sleep at night if I felt that decisions were made, boundaries were made because of who lived on the other side of, of the highway. I have some problems and it's, it's troubling. I'm seeing that right now. Um, I do wish that you all could work together. I wish you could work together and come to a resolution that you both see as a common good of all without um, being judgmental about people. And I'm, I'm, I'm picking that up as well, somehow. I don't, well. Um, I, I have to take one step at a time. Tonight, I'm just looking at um, I'm not looking at your community center. That's not what I'm looking at tonight. I'm just looking at the, at the boundary and, uh, of the district. And at this point, it looks like that I will support it because I have, I will support what the mission is trying to do. Let me make that clear. That is the politically wrong decision to make for some people, but it is politically right for me. Uh, because I support what you're doing. And then when you get ready to do whatever you want to do with your own property, that's, we'll look at that case when it comes before us. Um, but I, I thank everybody for your opinions. I just happen to uh, have a, an undergirding that pushes me to make sure that I look at uh, human causes uh, over uh, physical kinds of things, houses of, over uh, people. That's just where I am. I hope I made that clear enough for you. Uh, politically wrong for some, but spiritually right for me. Recognize Councilwoman Johnson and Councilman Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to make a few comments. And again, thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight um, and really being a part of um, helping us make this important decision. Um, I want to go over a couple of things. And I, in general, I support this historic district. And I, I have heard a lot of concerns tonight that um, some of which I feel are things that I think we as a council and as a community need to grapple with and other things that I think I want to push back on a little bit that I don't think are quite accurate in terms of what a historic district would do. Um, I think our staff has communicated both to us and to folks in the community that a historic district would not prevent the rescue mission from building a community center or building affordable housing. I don't think that whether or not we include or exclude the mission's property will have an impact on renters being pushed out. There are a lot of economic issues that are happening in Golden Belt right now and in all of the central neighborhoods of Durham. Um, property values are increasing. There is a serious risk of displacement for people who are living in these low-income communities. I don't think that the historic district on its own will impact that. Um, whether property values go up or down, again, I think the data is kind of still out on that. There are some studies that show that historic districts increase property values. There's also data that shows that stabilization can keep property values in neighborhoods um, from appreciating rapidly. So I think that that's something that we're unable to predict right now. Um, what I do believe is that a historic district would add, as one of the speakers said, an additional layer of bureaucracy to work that the mission would try to do, and that it would increase the cost of projects by having to deal with that additional layer of bureaucracy through the city. And I think that that's what we are trying to balance with the desire to preserve the Golden Belt community. And for me, that's the main question, is that extra layer, that increased cost that would impact um, the work of the rescue mission, because I do support that work. I recently, earlier this year, became a donor to the rescue mission. I've heard a lot about the great work that's been done in the community, and I understand that this is an important community institution and resource that we as a city need to value. Um, I also think that we need to value the history 
um, of the Golden Belt community and the needs of the folks who live in that community to maintain their neighborhoods um, in in the ways that they would like to see those neighborhoods maintained. So right now, I feel like I'm not willing to support the the boundaries that are proposed by the rescue mission, but I would be willing to support some other another boundary and concession to the fact that we are adding costs to future projects that you all would like to do, and that as a nonprofit, those costs are significant um, and might significantly impact the work that you're trying to do. So that's what I think we need to figure out, is how do we balance those two things and what would be appropriate um, in light of the fact that we are actually, we are imposing a cost. I think it's for a good cause, but there is, um, there is going to be an impact to your work. And so we need to figure out how we can, in some way, mitigate that impact. Thank you. I can ask Councilman Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, at the end of a law and order episode, after the trial is done and the judge is giving their verdict and, they're, and, and the judge is like, well, on the one hand and on the other hand, and you're sitting there waiting and waiting, I hate that. I used to be a prosecutor. I used to hate that in real life too. Judges learned it from law and order. This is what you do when you hand down a verdict. It's crazy making. So um, I'm, I'm personally of the opinion that if I'm gonna give you a long explanation about why I'm gonna vote a particular way, I ought to tell you up front what it is, then I can talk about why, and you can be mad at me the whole time I talk about it, and that'll just, that's something we'll work out between us uh, as we go along uh, in our time together. I intend to vote to support the boundaries as proposed by the consultant. Um, first and foremost, I wanna thank all the folks who came here and supported the Durham Rescue Mission. I had the opportunity a couple of weeks ago to sit down with Ernie and Gail um, at, the, at the mission, talk about your operation. I also had the opportunity to share with them my experience um, when I was a younger person starting a homeless shelter in, in Massachusetts um, and working there for three years. Uh, often was the time that I got knee bound with a particular one of our guests um, and prayed to the Lord about their situation. Uh, so the faith-based aspect of what the Durham Rescue Mission does, and I mentioned this to Ernie, is really, really important to me. I think that is something that we need more of uh, in our community, and I support that mission. Mm -hmm. um, if I thought that the creation of this historic district with, with the proposed boundaries would change one iota of what the Durham Rescue Mission does today, I would vote against it. But it does not. It simply does not. You have come here tonight and told us some wonderful plans that you have that you might do in the future with property that you own that is within the currently proposed boundaries of the historic district. But you have not said that the creation of the historic district with the current boundaries would alter one iota of the work that you're doing today. Um, so language, uh, rhetoric, some might call it, that this proposed district is somehow uh, ruining the Durham Rescue Mission, that it is opposed to the mission of the Durham Rescue Mission, uh, that seems far-fetched to me. I understand why people want to make those arguments. This is hard stuff. Um, but when I look at the work that the Rescue Mission is doing today, I don't see an impact from the creation of the local historic district with the boundaries currently proposed. When I ran for this office last year, um, I was asked under what circumstances would I support the creation of a new local historic district. Let me tell you what I said. The creation of, a new, lo of new local historic districts would need to arise organically from the neighborhoods in question, and any new district would need to be an area of special historical and architectural significance with particular integrity of design, setting, and association. But where an area meets these qualifications and is supported by the residents, I would support the creation of additional local historic districts. That was my answer last year. I feel the same way today. That's how I represented myself to the voters a year ago, and it's how I should act as a member of this council. If you came to me and said that the historic uh, district would interfere with the mission of the work that you're doing right now at the mission, I would oppose it. If we had a raft of other residents of the Golden Belt, his proposed Golden Belt Local Historic District to come to the microphone and say, I wanna do this, that, and the other with my house and this district makes that impossible, I would also have a hard time supporting it. But the fact of the matter is there is a process in place. 2,139 days ago, the people of this community asked this city in the only way they could to protect what is very special about their neighborhood. They have gone through administrations, changes in this, in this dais right here, 
and the election of new members of the city council and the retirement of others, waiting for their chance for this day to give voice to their desire to form this district. As my friend Tom Miller said, it is the only way that they have at their disposal in our, universe, in our UDO to protect what is special about their neighborhood. And I will not, because of the good ideas that y'all have about what the mission wants to do in the future, I will not sacrifice their desires to protect their neighborhood on the altar of what you think you might want to do later. If I can be supportive in that work, I hope you will call upon me. But until that time, this is the work we're doing today. And so I intend to vote on the boundaries as currently proposed. Thank you. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to also thank uh, everyone who came out uh, on both sides, or maybe I should say all sides of this issue, because it really has been, there, there are lots of different aspects to this, and I thought they were well addressed. Um, I, I do want to begin uh, with uh, one uh, um, uh, thank you that I think hasn't been said, which is this, uh, we, we wouldn't be talking about this at all uh, had not Councilmember Moffitt uh, about a year and a half ago uh, brought to the Council the fact that we had had this petition, we have this process, and we had not honored it uh, by going ahead with this study and brought us and the uh, in the last the end of the budget process a couple years ago the idea that we needed to do this study and we needed to budget for it and uh, so it was really Councilmember Moffitt who got us off the dime and uh, did the study that we really needed to do and I want to appreciate you for that time um, I want to also say um, uh, that uh, appreciate uh, the Mills and everybody uh, who is here from the rescue mission who does all the amazing work that gets done there. I, I know some of you that I see here who are board members and I think that there are things that the rescue mission does in this community that no one else does that really need to be done. And your work is noble and I'm very, very appreciative of it. The, I thought the consultants did a great job, Cynthia. I'm not sure if you're the only one here, but I want to thank you and your partner for what I thought was an excellent and super professional job on the, on the, on the, um, on the district. Um, I, um, uh, to uh, take up Charlie's uh, challenge, uh, I'm going to uh, cut to the chase here and say that I am supportive of the uh, district as recommended by staff. I am quite appreciative of the uh, objections of those of you all who came to talk on behalf of the rescue mission excluding the property. And I think that you make some very good points. I think that the point that it will be more expensive, it's true. There will be an extra layer of, of, uh, of uh, the Historic Preservation Commission approvals and that's, that's real. Um, My, my sense, though, is that um, what's really broken here uh, is not our, our, um, uh, our, our system of having a Historic Preservation Commission and having to go through it. I think all that is, is eminently negotiable. I think but what's broken is the relationship, and I'm sure that I, I'm not, I don't live in this area and don't observe it close up, but it's just clear from tonight that there's a lot of mending and healing that has to go on. And <clears throat> I'm sure that like all these things, you know, we're all in these kinds of relationships. And since we're talking about Solomon so much, I'll just say that I have a son named Solomon, okay? So I'm claiming that name for tonight. Uh, that there's lots of Solomonic wisdom that has to be applied to this. And like I say, I think that that is that's what strikes me tonight, just listening to everybody here is, is what's brought us to a place that's not where I think any of us really wants to be with us. In terms of the building, I think that a compatible community center building can be built within the confines of the historic preservation rules. I agree uh, that it will be more expensive because there will be more work that needs to be done because there will be an additional regulatory body. But I think, 
I think that that's a really important challenge that I would just offer to the rescue mission folks and that I would offer to the neighborhood. That the creation of that compatible building is something that needs to happen there in that neighborhood now. I just really believe that. Um, and I think that in a way the historic the the uh, the the create the the historic district is an is an opportunity to do that. It creates that opportunity because it asks people to build a building that is compatible, and everybody gets to talk about what that is. So I do favor the historic uh, the uh, I do favor the district as recommended by the consultants. I'll be voting accordingly. I'm appreciative of everybody's opinion, and since I've been appreciating, I do want to appreciate one more thing that I have observed tonight, which I've observed many times, but I do want to appreciate it particularly tonight. Uh, I was joking with my colleague, uh, Council Member Johnson, that in a minute, Mayor Bell is going to go out into the audience and he's going to grab one more person to pull up there to that microphone. <laughs> uh, I don't know anybody who could be more solicitous of community input and who really not only listens but wants all of us to listen with that same kind of intensity to everybody and appreciates everyone's opinion and wants every voice to be heard. So Mr. Mayor, I want to appreciate that again. So those are my comments. Thank you very much. Can I ask Councilman Moffitt if you have comments? Otherwise, I'm going to ask that we bring this to a close and vote. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. I'm just, um, what, um, my colleague, uh, Councilman Davis said that um, he had a word for tonight, and I had a word too, which is, I feel like I've heard a lot of divisiveness. And um, that's, that's something I feel is really unfortunate, because this is really a pretty, I mean, it's, um, uh, Councilman Schultz said we need to bring Solomonic wisdom to it. And uh, I understand that, but on the other hand, it is a fairly straightforward land use issue. But I heard people tonight that I consider to be friends testify on both sides of the issue. We got email from out of state on both sides of the issue. We heard ministers speak on both sides of the issue. We heard from members of the Planning Commission tonight on both sides of the issue. Um, we've heard that it's going to protect the affordability of homes and it's going to make them unaffordable. But tonight, and we've also heard about the works of the, uh, the rescue mission, both in, in good terms and in not good terms. We heard about the people who live in the community in good terms and in not good terms. Um, tonight's not about the care for the homeless and, or the recovery programs or the many other ways that the rescue mission helps those less fortunate. It's not about residents of the district, whether they were born in Durham or whether they belong in East Durham. Um, tonight is about the community, the neighborhood, and uh, the impacts on it. It's seen a lot of change over the last few years. Um, what, over the four years since it did, uh, they, they first filed the petition. Um, and, you know, it's been uh, NCDOT starting work on Alston. We've heard about that. We've heard, we've seen that many houses in the eastern part of the proposed district have been demolished. We've seen that houses have been renovated by their owners. We've heard about property values rising because of those renovations, the work that people have been doing on their houses. And um, we've seen that habitats are building homes for affordability there. Um, and, and, and we see work just outside the district at the rescue mission and other places. And, um, and so what we're really, what we have to figure out is what are the impacts of our decision on, on all the residents of Durham, the, the people who support the mission, who um, are supported by the mission, the people who live in the community, and, um, and all the many people that we've spoke to. I've thought a lot about this issue. Um, I've met with, uh, with Reverend and Ms. Mills and their team. I've walked, talked with other property owners and residents of the proposed district. I've walked the streets of the area. I've been in houses there. I have drove it yet again today. I've tried to imagine the development the rescue mission says is in the works both ways, whether the, the, that land is within the district or outside of it. And the, the, the idea that um, being in the district would create an, a significant financial burden on the, on the mission, in my opinion, when we've heard a lot of opinions and it's hard to get to, like what is really the cost burden of doing this? 
but um, I, I approach it not from, do you agree with me, is it more expensive or is it less expensive, but I really tried to approach it from, what do I think the impact is going to be and what, what, am I, what do I find out in that process? And I find that, I believe that it's going to add a significant burden only if the rescue mission plans to do a, a poor quality development, but I've seen what they do. I know that that's not their plan. I know they wouldn't do that. So I don't think that being in the district would create an undue uh, burden on them. What the historic designation will do is to ensure that all development, including the rescue missions, will be in keeping with the character of the community. It won't block rezonings. It won't change the building code. It won't keep the rescue mission from further development. Changes in the land use zones will still be required, but that's true in any case. Um, if they want to build, for example, a community center. Um, so uh, I am, I, I, came, I came in tonight with a leaning towards the, the proposed uh, district boundaries. I, I do hear the argument about property owners being included that don't want to be included. Um, I did, I will note that I did not hear a single other property owner. Um, I, uh, the issue that the petition only represents a small number of the property owners in the district um, is offset by the fact that not a single other property owner in the district um, was here tonight that I remember hearing um, asking not to be included. So um, my, my tendency is still um, towards the property, the uh, district zone boundaries as proposed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I entertain a motion on the item, please. Recognize Councilman Shul. I move that we approve the uh, the historic district bound boundaries as recommended by the consultant. Do we have a second on that? Second. Uh, it's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Open the vote. Close the vote. It it passes five to two with Mayor Bell voting no and council member Davis voting no. Are you voting no, Ms. Yes, sir, It passes four to three with Mayor Bell voting no. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden says she's voting no and council member Davis voting no. All right, thank you. Let's move on to the next item. We had an item that was pulled, item seven, parking meters downtown. It's Doug Henderson James here. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. There's also a consistency statement because oh, it's okay. a zoning. Move Thank you. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Is Mr. Doug Henderson James still in the audience? Mr. Doug Henderson James. Uh, I assume he's not here. Oh, okay. Mr. James, you can come on up. No, you don't have to. You can come on up. We we we, we got you. Oh, you can't get around them. Is that what you're saying? Oh, sorry about that. Jump over the rail. Yes, sir. I'm sorry to keep you as you, you didn't keep You didn't do anything. You, you're fine. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, you could have passed it earlier and gotten done a little bit earlier. Right. Um, I'm Doug Henderson James. I live at 130 Hunt Street between Rigsby Avenue and Mangum Street. And I'm here as a spokesman for the residents who live on that block of Hunt Street. And I want to say, First, what we want, and what we want is A, the parking meters that are proposed, and there are several reasons why we want those parking meters. One of them is to control traffic. No, it's control cars that are left on our block that we don't know who belongs to and turns out to be stolen, and we've had several of those in the last week and a half. And also because there are people who park there 
who then walk away and we don't know exactly where they're walking to because they don't come back very quickly and I'm talking three or four days before they show up again. So we do want the parking meters, so don't, that's why this is not an anti-petition or a statement. What we are looking for, though, is a, something similar to what you give people who live in Trinity Park and in Trinity Heights. There is a bee sticker program that allows residents in those communities who are close to East Campus put those on their cars so they do not have to move their cars every two hours to avoid getting ticketed or towed. We would like the same type of program for all the residents who live on that one block of Hunt Street. Why do we want that? Is because parking is very limited on that block of Hunt Street. You can only park on one side of the street. Uh, if you put parking on both sides of the street, you're gonna have to make it one way because you can only get three cars on abreast on that block. Second reason we want it is I don't think people realize how fast the use of the uh, Center for Senior Living is growing and a lot of the spots on the street are taken by those people and they, thank you. Thank you, Mr. James. Are there any comments, questions by members of the council? I recognize Councilman Marvin. <laughs> Doug, the, the, um, I appreciate the email I got, um, and I've been exchanging email with staff. The problem that I have, so I, I understand, you know, I know there are single family residences on the street, and so I'm a little concerned about a single family residence that has no off street parking. Um, but the problem I have with the, um, I, I, and I certainly differentiate that from the, from the housing co op. The problem I have with, with doing what you want to do with the housing co-op is what do we say to all the other residential buildings downtown who say, yes, put parking meters, but let us park there as long as we want for free. We would have a, n a huge number of people who would, would want the same program that you're suggesting uh, for Hunt Street. And I, I don't know how to, like, I'm not Solomonic enough to be able to differentiate between Hunt Street and you know any other street downtown, I'm, I and I'm not fortunately in your position of having to make this decision. I'm just reporting what we on the street would like and why we would like it. I'd like to add one more thing for your consideration. It doesn't change, Don, the point that you just made. But we live within the bid. So we pay that extra seven cents, everybody on the block. And we don't get any more benefits than any other person who lives in the city of Durham, the county of Durham, or anybody that happens to visit Durham downtown. And yet we're at charge this additional seven cents as well. And it seems to me that in that sense, we more than pay for our parking meters with that amount of money that we contribute to the city, county, through that real estate tax. Uh, so that's basically it. The other point I make is that there are serious problems with parking on that street. The, the meter also is going to make a difficulty. And I'll mention the senior center, Center for Senior Life. Many people come to the center for more than an hour. They come for half a day. There's not enough parking already in that parking lot. You see them circle. You see them park on the street. By putting meters there, you're Something's going to have to give because those people, some of them are not going to be able to afford it. They're going to be there a long time coming back and forth. They're going to get tickets. They get ticketed now because they're not parking legally. So I think there seems to be, to, from our point of view, and I realize what you just said, Don, is a very difficult thing for you as council members, for the city, for Tom to deal with and everything. Um, but this is what we would like. Well... I, I guess you, you raise a very interesting question, and Don, you raise a very interesting question too. What, what struck me though was the comment that you don't get anything as a result of paying the extra bid tax. That, that bothers me. No, no, I said nothing that the rest of the city of Durham I, I, or county. Uh, well, I don't pay the bid tax. So what you're saying is that you don't get any more than I get. Right. I don't pay the bid tax. and. But I would think you would get more than I get by paying the bid tax. That bothers me. And in what way? 
I, 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 I've got to go and look at that. You should, because that's one of the concerns I had about the property that will be included in the whole bid piece. What benefits did they get beyond not being in the bid? I thought somebody comes maybe clean up the street more, patrol your street more. You ought to be getting something. Uh, you ought to be Mayor, benefiting somehow. I, I want to make sure that we understand the distinction between the bid seven cents and what you, the city, also contributes to DDI. I'm sorry. DDI gets money from the city to collect waste out of the one trash can that's on that block. Oh, so you do have trash can that they collect. Yeah, but that's okay. you're paying for it. Okay. Our taxes are paying the city to pay the DDI. It's not the bid seven cents that's paying for the pickup of that trash. That's that's yeah. my point. Uh, well, you, you raise an interesting point, and I still have, have a problem with that. Recognize Councilman Schuel and Councilman Reese. I thought we would be out here by 1030, but I guess. <laughs> so do you, do you, um, you built your building with no parking? No, we have parking there, places okay. there. How many do you have? We have 24 parking spaces for the 24 units. Okay, I see, thanks. So I guess I, my only other thing is I would ask, I see Mr. Leathers, if he had any comments on this. Uh, Thomas Leathers, Department of Transportation. Um, staff will be willing to explore control residential parking according to the ordinance and the requirements there. So we'll be willing to, like any other downtown resident, work with them to see if there are some options that we can afford them. Mr. Manager, I'd, I'd like to give the staff an opportunity to do that. It's, it's built in. It, it, there's a process right. to do that. Okay. Well, right. does Mr. Mr. James, did you hear what he said? Yes, I did. I heard it and appreciate it very much. Okay. All right, so recognize Councilman Martin. Yes, and, and, and you probably realize this from the item. There is a map in the item, but the map is not part of the what we're doing tonight, right? We're, we're establishing, we've already established an ordinance that they can charge, and now we're going to um, set up the rates, if I remember the correct order, but the exact location of the meters is not something that we're establishing in tonight's motion. Right. All right, entertain a motion on item. So moved. Second. Been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Anything else to come before the council no, tonight? Sir. Thank you. The no, meeting's sir. adjourned at 10.34 p.m. Thank you. Okay.